You're listening to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Sunday, March 27th, and we are live from Boston. This is your host, Stephen Novella, and joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Tara Santa Maria. Howdy. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. Evan Bernstein. Hello, Boston. And not just a special guest, but a regular rogue and our brother in skepticism, George Robb. Wicked Live Podcast, wow. Wicked, Wicked Live. live. <laughs> Let's pod. Let's pod this bastard. <laughs> They're all shaking their heads. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Thank you, George. Does anybody in here have a really thick Boston accent? Please. Anybody, please. Come on. You might not well, know it about yourself. Know. Does anybody <laughs> point to somebody else? I think yeah. you're laughing, so you do, don't you? No, that's the girl from Virginia, Jay, if you remember from five minutes ago. Oh. No. <laughs> um, so last night we were in New York. So, of course, we were thinking, all right, so which city's better, New York or Boston? Yeah. We thought we would just we're talk about that. Throw down the gauntlet. Yeah, just throw it down. So what do you guys think? New York. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to start off with a, with a fun bit that George came up with. Ooh. Oh, about... he did open with it. Tell, tell us about so. it, George. It's just, I, I, I've seen other people do this, and I wanted to get the rogue's take. This is something called over-under. I'm going to just list a bunch of random things, and the rogues are going to say whether they think it's overrated or underrated or properly rated. And hopefully it'll foster some nice conversation and debate. Not that, that you know, you guys ever debate about anything no, in particular. We agree on everything. So again, we're going to say sort no, of we over... Do. We debate on stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what we should probably do is just do a quick whip down the line and then we can ha- maybe have a conversation about it. So we'll start from Kara and go down. And again, say overrated, underrated, or properly rated. Okay? Mm-hmm. I got a bunch here. Let's go with... Here's the first one. Avocados. Oh, Overrated. Overrated, 100%. Properly. Proper. Overrated. We're an anti-avocado bunch yeah, over here. Really? Well, yeah. I live in L.A. It's like they, they put avocado on everything. I know. It's, it's like, no, I don't everywhere. like it. I don't and like I hate avocado. avocado. Me too. They're weird. Yeah, right, well, that explains it. They're I mean, weird soft fruits. If you like Even guac, if you I like, like them, I think they would be overrated. <laughs> I don't like guac. <laughs> no. Guac is poison. No. Guac is wrong, poison? Right? Okay, I grew up in Texas. Wrong, I eat right. queso. Wait, it's that's gross. Your, that's your, <laughs> I'm gross. Your curse of super tasting. You probably are tasting. That's right. You're talking to two super tasters over there. That's true. I love it. I love it. It's great in sushi. It's great in salads. Right? It's 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 an augmenter. It's fair. It's fair. But you want it on everything. Just no, I didn't want it on everything. In LA, it's literally on so everything. So it's overrated. How, okay, how nutritious? What's, what's the nutrition you get out of the avocado compared to the It actually you're sucks consuming? nutrition out of your body. <laughs> <laughs> it's good fats, right? It's a good fat. Yeah. And it's got chlorophyll. I mean, clearly. George, got, you clearly yeah. like avocado. I love them. Yeah, I, do I, too. I, I, could, I could eat guac every day. If so I, are if you I properly would. rated or are you underrated? I, I would say proper or, or under. I'd yeah, say, yeah, I'd nice. say properly rated. I mean, on a, on a uh, ginger salad. Oh, oh forget about God, it. God, forget yeah. it. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, 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 absolutely. All right. This is fascinating. Minecraft. <laughs> I don't know anything about Minecraft. It's rated. <laughs> Children love it, right? I don't know. I Skip guess. me. I don't know. I think it's properly rated. Okay. Properly, for sure. Overrated. No. Overrated. The blocky graphics, I Gents, can't get why? past it. Okay. Evan, why is it overrated? Uh, overrated, well, frankly, I don't play it. <laughs> uh, I, your opinion is worth I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think it's cool kind of what people are able to do with it but I still don't find it impressive enough to devote the apparently thousands of hours you need to do to achieve these kinds of artistic expressions mm-hmm. so my, my response to that Evan is it's a, it's a wonderful game to let your kids get into as, like, as one of their first video games because there is a lot of creative, uh, an enormous amount of creativity. Like if they're playing you know, World of Warcraft, for example, mm-hmm. you know they're running around, they're going on missions, they're killing things right. and stuff, and there's nothing to learn. But in Minecraft, there is so much to do. You have to really be leaning on your creativity. Yeah, but can we have high res creativity? <laughs> well, Bob, this is the problem. Is that too much to ask this for. The, and 
the premise behind Minecraft is, is it, it's, pretty, it, it's pretty simple, right? It is, there is a simplicity to it. Now, think about it. The smaller you go with, like, so let's call it the building blocks. The smaller you go in the building blocks, the harder it would be to craft things, right? Yeah, but I'm not saying you've got to stack pixels, but make the, the smallest block made out of a lot of pixels instead of three. You know, that, that's all I'm saying. You could, you could up the yeah, res it, and still be creative. And, and There's not a give and take. To, there's a co pros and cons to that, and I think they... Yeah, it would they, slow down the processing. It would slow down, massively. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Slow down the processing? Yeah. It, with the, our computers and video games yeah. and today's yeah. technology, oh, i got to wait for this block to settle down into that spot. <laughs> no, Bob, no, you, you, have to understand, you have to understand the engine. It's, like it's, it, it's a game where you can control any block in a world. You know what I mean? All right, so all right, you can interact with anything. I get that. That, that will yeah. up the it processor. But lot. still, you could up the res a certain amount. To me, it's like, what is it? I'm not playing a video game that looks 35 years old. That's not the important part of it, Bob. The aspect <laughs> of... Visuals are not important not, for a game. If I'm looking at a computer screen, visuals are important. So this is what the... None of you hear this on the actual show because it all gets edited out. <laughs> But what I love about this group of people is that it doesn't matter what the topic is, they're equally, we are equally passionate yeah. about avocados and Minecraft but the thing and is about everything. Working. Minecraft is like a digital box of crayons. <laughs> so it's like I was saying, are crayons overrated? Or people spend too much time drawing stuff with crayons. It's like, whatever. It's a, it's, it's a mechanism. It's a vehicle for creativity, creativity. in the digital realm. Yep. I get that. You know? right. There's a little bit of a playing aspect to it if you want to, but you can also play in creative mode, but that, that's not there at all. All you're doing is just building. All right, so here's stuff. a box of three but, crayons, and here's a box of 20 crayons. Which one are you, you well, going to draw with? Do you know that you could build a working computer in Minecraft? Yes, I know, I know that for sure. It's fat. The creativity is awesome. It's yeah. wonderful. That, all right, we I'm, get I'm it. All right, we got, we got it, your point. Right. You don't have to keep making yeah, it. Yeah. Right. Then stop asking <laughs> Sorry, about George. it. No, no, no. It's great. This is why we're doing it. This is why we're doing it. I love it. The passion is essential. Yeah, I've got to uh, answer your question. New Year's Eve. Oh, uh, uh, um, God. Overrated. Yeah. Overrated. Overrated. I have to calculate in my overrated. head the right answer every yeah. time. I'm like, Jay? Overrated, it sucks. Yeah. yeah. Like, like Evan? grossly overrated. Double overrated. Yeah. Everyone's saying it's overrated. So, I agree. It's overrated. generally a disappointment. Can we generally. ask the audience? I'm dying to hear. What do you got? Oh, overrated. Right? overrated. Why do we keep spending you know, money on know, New Year's right? Eve? You know, like you're a young adult. Remember, we were like young adults. Like, yes, New Year's Eve. We don't have to hang out with our parents. Let's go out and have fun. And we pay money, good money, to be someplace. Overpriced. Down, and it's like, this really sucks. Why <laughs> do we? You try that a few years and like, that's it. We're just going to have impromptu get-togethers and and make nothing special about it. We play games at my house. We do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, that's fun. Yeah. I feel yeah. like a lot of New Year's Eve is just about like how drunk can people get before the ball drops, and that's not fun for yeah. a lot of people. Steve and I it's an unsafe uh, holiday. Steve and I have written... Uh, Three LARPs. Yes, LARPs, New murder Year's mystery Eve. kind of It's a events. party LARP. Yeah, know, so party. You, you had like 20, 30 a people park. over. <laughs> yeah, and... Yeah, <laughs> part. <laughs> and we, we, we write a game. One of them, a couple of them were period games. Yeah. So we have mm -hmm. to come. We give them characters. They come in like a 1910 or something. Solve the mystery. You have to solve the mystery. And One time, you have to go yeah, out. And oh, like, yeah. We had a scavenger hunt. You had to drive around, around town to find signs. Like, Tons of fun. Game. I wasn't yeah. invited to that. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Right, Those so are all, good. But that can, you could do that any time. Right? Yeah. We all agree. Good. Thank you. Uh, college. Properly uh, rated. Ooh. Steve? That's a complicated question, yeah. yes. actually. I think, yeah, I think if all things, yeah. given all variables, properly rated. Yeah, I think I would, it's, I would say it is sometimes overrated, sometimes underrated, and it comes out in the wash as mm -hmm. uh, sort of an average, but it's not like always properly mm -hmm. rated. No, okay. definitely not. I'm going to go with underrated simply because I, would want, I want people to make a bigger deal out of it. Okay. I want it to be more of a priority. I think, as a, like everybody gets to go to college for free, and we are pushing the youths into college. The youths. Youth? <laughs> he said the youths. Youth. Wow. <laughs> Watch my cousin Vinny. The youths got to be smarter. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have to go with under uh, uh, overrated because return on investment dollar for dollar. Yeah. My college edu I, I have four years. I have four year just a bachelor's degree. I went from nineteen eighty eight to. Uh, 1992, state school. I, for those four years, I paid thirteen thousand dollars for the all, for all mm -hmm. four years. And I feel like that was a very good return on my investment. Wow, that's like mm -hmm. books yeah. cost that. Much I don't know how. I, I don't. And you, you see the problems we're having today with student debt. It's yep. so beyond out of control. It's bankrupting families in some. But cases. the thing is, there are ways to do college in an affordable way. But I don't think culturally. I think we stigmatize. 
community college and we stigmatize local commuter colleges. And I would love to see a more of a celebration of that. Like, why do we and put... And trade schools. Yeah, and trade schools, vocational training. Like, why do we put the really expensive private and Ivy Leagues on such a pedestal? I think that's part of the problem. They're yeah. overpriced. Yeah. I think there's multiple Primarily reasons for that. Mm-hmm. My undergrad at, at a state school, I went to the yeah. University of North Texas, and I had a state of Texas grant. We didn't have money. My family didn't have money, and so we were able to get, like, a waiver. So it was I got to go to college for free, which was yeah. really cool. And then my master's was 30000 that I, yeah. I paid for myself. Um, actually, yeah. I took out loans, so I paid them off. And I would say my Ph.D., though, because it's a it's yeah. – it's, you know, most PhDs, research PhDs, you're on fellowship, so you're using the grant money of your major professor. But if it's a practical PhD, like medical school, yeah. or that's an MD, or a uh, law degree, or clinical psych, um, I want to say it's averaging out to 150. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah, but I was very lucky. This is why I went to school late in life. I told myself I will not take out student debt, so I amortize it and I pay a yeah. monthly fee. I pay a second mortgage basically yeah. every month to pay for my university education. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot. I'm, I'm but I also think it is a good investment in, yeah. my, in my future. I, I think it's, over, on the whole, I think it's overrated. If we take sort of the financial, and that makes it, uh, it a hard question, right? When we're talking about over and underrated, you have to put the financial consideration into it. But the education and the opening of your mind and the critical thinking skills and, you know, especially if you go to, if you have like a liberal arts education, yeah. right? Like, I think there's almost nothing that compares to that. I agree. That's why that's the underrated part. Mm-hmm. I do yeah, think I that, agree with that. Mm-hmm. Is there too expensive? But I don't think we need to have this narrow conception of everybody goes to a four-year, you know, standard right. college. It could be like, I agree that the, the value of, just of, a, of, the, of, a, yeah. of a liberal arts education, maybe two years is baseline. Then if you want to add, flesh that out to a full bachelor's degree or maybe then go into a trade school or whatever. Mm-hmm. Let's make it more tailored to what people actually need for their life rather than just party for four years and then... You, you know, you have right. massive debt, and you get into the, you know a job. See, know? I think trade schools are tremendously under They're underrated. Tremendously yeah. underrated. Yeah. That some totally. kids should go from high school to a trade school. There's no need to 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 do two two three. The years European to model, yeah. by the way, the European model is basically what we consider high school to is for them is like a six year. Right. That it's, so it's basically like our high school and the first two years of college are basically one six-year education. Yeah. And then you go into whatever you're – you go into medical school or trade school or whatever yeah. it is you're going to do, your well, master's I like program. That. That's the way it be. I don't know if that's better, but that's what they well, do. the it's, thing about it that's can, nice is that everybody gets the access to that liberal yeah. art. Because the thing about right. if we only did trade schools is that sort of philosophy, that, you know, mm-hmm. oh, critical yeah. no, thinking. No, it's like missing for – because we don't have that. Our high schools don't. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you know, we, we got to overhaul. I have, I have – real quick, I just want to throw this out idea out there. So hopefully somebody will hear it and maybe do something. But, and it's the beginning of an idea, but I think it would be very interesting if we set up, when I say we, like the United States yeah, right? set, sets up a free, a free online college for anybody. Right? Yeah. I know I you're not getting the social basically stuff. Exists. I actually think that's happening. It basically yeah. exists but, already. But, you have to cobble it together, but it's out there. But, and you can also Khan Academy and like Coursera. There's like some options, but you might need the self-efficacy to like figure it out and build it yourself. But I, I just think like like put like if you can't afford college, then just yeah. do this. Like go here, you'll get and actually get a degree. You'll get a degree. Yeah. You'll, yeah. you'll get at least yeah. you know a, a good enough education. Yeah. You're not going to have the social stuff and all that, but at least you can get yourself educated. Yeah. Why don't we do that? It, well, again, it already exists. But it should, you want to formalize that. But also, yeah, why don't yeah. we have national – I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. Like yeah. most developed Western nations have free college right. or some form of that, that's a way to like yeah. – whether you're doing community service in exchange or, or uh, enlisting in the, in the military or All something right, here's like one, that. Here's one yeah. similar to that. Uh, bacon. Underrated. <laughs> okay. Bacon makes everything better. Okay. I think it's appropriate. I think bacon's appropriate. Properly rated. rated. Yeah. Okay. Jay? I think it's. I think everybody perfectly understands how awesome it is. It's, it's yeah. appropriately okay. rated. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Bacon's underrated. <laughs> so yeah, properly. Yeah, I mean, it's, everyone knows how awesome it is. It's not everyone. like it doesn't have a reputation for being awesome. Yeah. But is it too big a reputation for being no, awesome? I think, for it's the health benefits no. or the health. The, the everything in moderation. Right. That's what I mean. So it's bad everything for you, but in moderation. Okay. Punch okay. that hard. I mean, it's freaking awesome. So we got to have things in this world that we just love. Let's do two more here. All right. Radio. I think it's properly rated. I don't think it has a rating anymore. I don't think people have much of an opinion about it. Oh, I do. That's, that's interesting. Radio. I'm, I'm going with FM, though. <laughs> don't ask no. me about AM because that's a radio. whole – AM that's is definitely overrated. Um, yeah, again, I don't think it's massively over or underrated. I think it's – you know, again, it's, it fills it's a niche and people use it for what it is. I think it's proper. Properly rated. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think it's underrated. Um, I'll tell you why. 
there was something about the collective sharing of a, a collection of music, as an example. Like growing up, like there was a couple of radio stations that I listened to, and and I, I like the the communal idea that a lot of people are listening to the same music. You also get to know the personalities of the DJs and all that, and there's something kind of really good about and that. And I don't like that. I don't like being told what I'm supposed to, oh, this is popular. This is what you're supposed to listen to. I know, but th- that's why today, like, we are so on demand. Like, we can be, like, yeah, everything could be so unbelievably tailored. But but the thing is, uh, uh, with a radio station, you will hear things that you normally wouldn't. I, I don't know. But just the thing is, you that. don't. You just hear the same top 40 over and over. That's the problem. If you listen to a top 40 station. Yeah. Sure, yes, but, but there, there aren't are other... that many terrestrial radio stations that are doing cool, like, it's like maybe late yeah, at night, there. there's the one hour slot. It's just another K-Rock chip in the whole, like, we're, we're less of a community. As much as we're connected on the internet, I feel like we're less of a community as a species now because of, because of the internet. Like, I don't We've know. We've lost like, a lot of the shared experience. Yeah, like I just I remember yeah. talking to friends and being like, "Did you hear the thing on the radio?" Yeah, and it's like it was an, it was like a newspaper almost that everyone was sharing with each other. Yeah, I like a generation I like thing. that. Evan, definitely oh. under under underrated. Oh, yeah. um, I I grew up a radio junkie. Um, you know, our friend Perry. Yeah. He and I would get in the car, drive around just so we could listen to the radio. And we didn't listen to music. We listened to a lot of talk radio. We listened to a lot of comedy radio. We listened to morning radio um, uh, ensemble cast, which is kind of what I like in The Skeptic's Guide, too. We are not exactly, but sort of like an AM morning show radio format in which there's a main host and a supporting cast of people around, around the main host. Yeah. I've always envisioned us, and, I've, I think, and I know I've learned a lot about my communication skills from having listened to a lot of talk radio having grown up. And it's, it's, it also brings me back to a connection with my father that I had, mm-hmm. who also enjoyed talk radio. So I, it's, I'm very biased. I think there's a nostalgia factor that you guys are talking about, but that's right. not what talk radio is like now. What does Bob say? Yeah. I, don't, I don't have an answer for this one. Okay. I, don't, I don't know what to say on this one. It's, I, I don't know what anyone... I never talk about radio. I never <laughs> listen to radio. Wait, you listen to Howard Stern? Oh, God, no. I did, I did years ago, right. and now I got, a, I got a new car. Like, oh, I got free XM, so I listen to them for a half hour or so. But it's great to pop around to some of the XM radio stations, you know, right. the, 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 the types of, That's the not types FM, of music. Though. No, no, no. But now and, you can just do that but Spotify. But I'm all audiobooks. I listen to just audiobooks right. from, or, or, so, or my music. That's it. Radio is so I have no idea what people think about radio these days. I can't tell you if it's over. It's under. also universally accessible. In other words, you need very little money to get into a, an opening of all True, sorts of True, but radio. also, I will say, and this is like an L.A. bias, so it probably doesn't relate to anybody, but there's so many mountains in L.A. Yeah. that, like, terrestrial radio is garbage in L.A. Like, yeah, it's yeah. just constantly going in and out when you're driving around the city. Yeah. You have to be in the right pockets. It's, it's annoying. Yeah. What's really curious, though, is that with the proliferation of podcasts, Podcasts. Podcasts are essentially radio, radio broadcasts. Yeah, yeah. They're radio shows, and it's amazing that the popularity of podcasts, once you once you change the accessibility and the, the way you can receive it, they just exploded because people like this audio content. It's so and, and feed readers are free. That's the thing. Free, there are a million yeah, ways to not, listen. To they're not they're not interrupted yeah. by mountains and yeah. by clouds and things. Like that. It's just and it's on your time. Yeah, yeah. You, could, you could stop and pause and all that. All stuff. right, one more. Here we go. Let's end with something light. First Amendment. <laughs> Overrated, underrated, uh, properly rated. Under, I mean, well, uh, properly under, I don't know, it's awesome. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, it's awesome. When, when, when appropriately interpreted. Well, that's the problem. Yeah. 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 That's caveats. The I mean, I think overall it's underrated. Yeah. Because, you know, countries that don't have it have a problem, but it's also massively abused, which is right. kind of tangential to you, what we're talking about. Yeah, I would just say part of the... underrated but complicated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would say we have, I'd have to label it as underrated because just how epically important it is. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we should always act as if it's underrated. Like, yeah. we yeah, need right. it. It has to be there. Yeah. The government cannot and shall not take it away from us, and we, it needs to pro- proliferate around the world. Uh, yeah, what Steve says, what Jay says, definitely underrated. Yeah, there's a reason why it is the first, first yeah. amendment. There's, leave it at that. I agree with everybody. My only thing about it is, is you look at the second amendment and a lot of the arguments for modifying the second amendment is that because when it was written, yeah. uh, weapons were what they were. You didn't have, you know, automatic weaponry and things like that. You had, you had musket, you know, barrel loading things and weapons were used in a very different way. As soon as you try to apply that to the First Amendment of saying, well, you didn't have Internet, you didn't have uh, web accessibility of information, like 
that's the only thing that makes me some, sometimes take a pause and go, does it need to be reconsidered on some level? Because I think definitely the second amendment should be. But it is. I think there are limits on the first amendment. No, and we forget yeah. that. Like, it's not just free and open. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. Is it is it seen as being like, it is. Absolute. And it's like. By some people. By some people, right? Yeah. And it probably shouldn't be, you know, especially in some I also think instances. we forget that it's not just about freedom of speech, but it's freedom of assembly, it's freedom press, of the sure. press, it's also freedom not to put yeah. one religion over another right. religion. And, and like, the it's, there's a lot of good, that. and yeah, it's all about the government's yeah. actions. Your we forget com- what it is. Yeah. yeah, George, your comment makes it seem to me that you're conflating just freedom and open speech with right. the First Amendment. The right. First mm-hmm. Amendment's about the government. Right, yeah. right. And, sure, sure. Like, uh, you know, I've had this conversation right. with my uh, free speech attorney, right, which I unfortunately had to have at right. one point, and he also has a blog where he writes about this kind of stuff, which I read all the time, and he's like, the first question you always have to ask is, is this a First Amendment question? Is right. this a First Amendment question? Right. Usually the answer is no, and right. then you're done. Because right. if, it, if it doesn't deal with the government's relationship to the speech... The government abridging speech, assembly, religion, yeah, all those things. Or speech or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. then it's not a First Amendment issue. Yeah. If it's a private company regulating their own platform, sure, sure. it's not a First Amendment issue. It's right. like I have the right to block comments yeah, on Facebook my own can, blog yeah, or right, to yeah, block you right. on but Twitter. If you, but if you, let's say, have a government that's going to say, you know, you, uh, like the, uh, uh, you can't false advertise. Like, yes. you know, you can't run an advertisement that's promising something that's not right. delivered. That's a, and that's, that's a fraud. government can kind right. of step in and yes. do that. So yeah, what is the promise that's, that's necessarily false? Is false information? Ah, la, 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 la. The whole thing yeah. kind of expands from there. Ooh. You know, yeah, so yeah. someone regulating... Uh, social media, let's say, government right. jumping in and saying you can't say that because it's not true or what. Again, it it it's a it's weird. It's weird. But that's it's why a, we have a judicial system. Sure, you know, sure, to sure. help no, interpret it, these things. Yeah. yeah, I know. And then the, we we talk about this. It's like, well, if we have the big tech companies do it, is that really better than having the government do it? Because they're like not beholden to anybody but right. themselves, their the shareholders. So it's it's <laughs> it does get complicated. I I read that I probably read the same article you did about the fact that. You know, yeah, the, the First Amendment's a couple hundred years old, yeah. and, you know, basically free speech has been weaponized right. in a way that could not have been anticipated by the framers of the Constitution. Mm-hmm. And do we have, does that make us reconsider this relationship with, with freedom of speech and access to information, et cetera, et right. cetera? Um, I just think the risks of, of allowing government regulation of speech is so massive. Sure. We have to always err on the side of not doing that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I... I think what we need to do is just educate people about what it actually means. Yeah, because yeah, I and think the weaponization is the is the mis- also the misinterpretation. It's misinterpretation yeah, yeah, of what it is. Yeah. It's like this is censorship. This is this is a violation of free speech. You deplatformed like, no, someone. That's yeah. That's a no, First no, Amendment is, issue. Oh god. This is an editorial decision yeah, right, about yeah. quality. It has nothing to do. You don't have. You don't deserve to be on my platform or whatever it is. Steve, apparently though that new, that nuance <laughs> is beyond. A but that's lot the of problem. That's why why I wanted to clarify. That is the problem, is that people conflate it all to freedom of speech. So I have the right to say anything anywhere to anyone under without any umbrella, without any right, consequences. Right. Like, no, you don't. Yeah. You don't have that right. No. It's, it's no, that's not at all. Yeah. I think it's important to just say something. I don't know if everyone's seen this, but like this, this, was, this is mind-blowing to me, and it's horrifying. Like, so I see reporters uh, in Russia very recently, and mm-hmm. they're, they're talking to a woman. She literally held up a sign, I think, that had like 2022 on it. And no, it said it said she was holding up a sign that said two words. Yeah, okay. It literally said there's an expression yeah, in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. Ukrainian, I'm gonna give you two it's like my two cents, basically. Okay, yeah. She said, Ken, if I hold up a sign that says two words, do you think I'd be arrested? And the mm. cameraman was like, Yeah, probably. And she holds up a sign and it says Dvaslava, which means two words. And the co- cops came in, or whoever the, the soldiers came in and George, so basically, like, I have within, a voice. Within That's like all she ten was seconds. Basically, yeah. Within yeah. like ten seconds. There wasn't like no war. No, it literally yeah, it was like, it was I have like, a voice. It literally said two cents. Yeah, they silenced you know, her. In essence, this was I mean, right. Now imagine living, could you imagine? But what's, what's amazing yeah. with that clip, if you saw the, if you keep watching, another woman comes up after the first woman gets taken off because she holds up the sign that says two cents, or two words. Another woman comes up and she's like, you know, I think, you know, the, the war is fine and we should be in Ukraine because there's a lot of awful stuff going on. She gets arrested. So they pull her off into the van. So she's literally for she's like for Putin and for the war, but because she's talking to a camera, the um, cops come in and take her off. So it's this weird like shot. So they're Freud equal like, opportunity. Yeah. yeah, it's like they don't, just no yeah. speech yeah. at all. No speech uh-huh. at all. It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. They oh, that, don't have a first amendment. Uh, brutal. Do you think yeah. I'd be arrested if I held up a sign that said two words? That's two words. Yeah, so it's this strange hybrid where we're like yeah. we have to <laughs> jealously, pro- you know, <laughs> defend the First Amendment, but not over apply it to situations to mean like 
anything goes, there's no editorial policy, there's no quality control, like abuse it. And, and essentially, it's always abu- being abused so that people, you know, say, I have the right to be an asshole whenever and wherever yeah, I want. Yeah, it's like people or, call, you know. they yell censorship when they don't want to be censored. Yes, right. And then... Then they ban books. Then they ban books. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, yeah. Right, right. yeah. It's like, mm. Anyway, that's Classic. over under. Nicely done, yes. Nice. Nice. Good, nice George. Nice fun. <laughs> All right, we're going to try to power through some news items. We're going to start with a CRISPR update. There's so much CRISPR news out there, again, to remind people... CRISPR is a, is a rec- fairly recent genetic technology we've developed from bacteria, actually, that your bacteria use, uh, use this system for, oh, their, bacteria. for their immune system. And we were able to leverage that as a way of doing relatively cheap and fast uh, and precise genetic modification. And this, it, the technology is a platform, and it's evolving really quickly. And so there's so much CRISPR. We, were only, we only occasionally talk about it, but... And for every one we talk about, like 20 papers were, were, were significant papers were published probably on the technology. So this is one that I thought peaked up above, above the background that I would mention. Um, so what the researchers did, they, they were trying to figure out a way to use CRISPR in order to turn on the expression of a gene. Now, we've spoken previously about CRISPR off and CRISPR on. Yeah, yeah. That was a use of CRISPR to... Um, turn off the expression of a gene to silence a gene without altering its code, right? So, Which is powerful because tr- if you make a mistake and you, you cut out a gene and there's a problem, like, oh, we got to get that gene and put it back. But with, with, with the off, you just like, oh, we, we want to reverse it. So you just, just turn just it back on. a switch, basically. Which they figured out how to do, too. So there's CRISPR off and there's CRISPR on. So you could silence a gene, then you can unsilence the gene. Right. right. So right. The, it's, of course, it's a, it's a way of doing... Like gene- a mute button? Yeah, it's a mute, way of doing mute, genetic mute. modification. It's a way of, of doing research. Say, I wonder what this gene does. Let's turn it off and see what happens. You know, it's a great research tool. But this technique is different because this is figuring out how to increase the expression of a naturally silenced gene. So it's not turning it off and then on. It's turning on a gene that had been turned off as a natural part of development. Right. So it's a different mechanism. So we all know that, you know, as, as we develop from a totipotent stem cell, right, an egg, into a person, cells develop along different pathways, and that's largely done by genes being turned on and off. You know, liver cells become liver cells by turning on the liver genes, right, and then heart cells turn on the heart genes and brain cells turn on the brain genes. So if I go to a liver cell and I want to turn on a brain gene, how do I do that, right? So that's what they're looking at. So, of course, right? Wait, because you're saying that all the... It's all there. All that every there. cell has every gene. Right, right, right. right but, but you only as long as they're still totipotent. You're talking about stem cells. No, no. This is any cell now. Okay, so you're just right. talking, but you're just talking about in the genetic code. Yes. They don't necessarily have all the right proteins and stuff if they've already. But if you turn it no, on. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll in fact, uh, if they've already differentiated, though, things become problematic. But I'll give you a little preview because okay, okay. you could use this to yeah. make a differentiated cell into a totipotent cell. Oh, right. You can back. You, you can yeah, back. Yeah. You can back it off by turning on. But you probably just have a couple of genes. And sometimes. you probably have to do that before you can then become a newly differentiated. cell. But that's not even what they're doing. Okay. So what they're interesting, they're, what they're interested in is saying, we'll take a cell, and turn on one gene. Uh-huh. So that we could know what that gene does, right? That's really that's the goal. Huge, that's huge because we huge. have, yeah, we've we've like gone through the genome, but we still have so many things where we're like, we don't know what that does. Yeah, we're and, really confused about this code. And to clarify, like when we say what it does, typically aren't we talking what about does what, what protein, protein does? Yeah, what protein? What protein does it good? But also, yeah. what effect does that protein have in the in the organism? Right? We can go to a right. mouse, turn on a gene, and say what protein now gets made, and also well, what, what happens to the do? mouse. So, yeah, yeah what does exactly. it do? that can help us with the proteome. To fill Absolutely. Out the proteome. Mm-hmm. Can I ask a quick side question? Yeah. When it when a cell makes a protein, it's ejecting it out into the bloodstream, right? No, not always. Well, it it gets so if it's like a a, a eukaryotic cell, like multi multicellular animals have, it, the the RNA comes out of the nucleus, and then it goes to it, the, it translates the the RNA sequence into a protein. That's the, the cytoplasmic reticulum or endoplasmic reticulum, and then yes, it, it, then something happens to that protein. But it gets, that protein it might gets stay further in, modified. It may stay in the cell. It may, it may go the to cell. the membrane, or it may get excreted. It has whatever fate is destined to it based upon its function. Right? And remember, proteins do almost everything in they their body. Every, proteins yeah. are like all your not all your enzymes. Some are nucleic acids, but most of your enzymes are proteins. So they catalyze almost every reaction yeah, in your body. Sure. And yeah, yeah, so they can, but they can go into the bloodstream. But no, a lot of times they'll stay in the cell, or they'll be in the. They'll I be transmembrane. It's, it's, 
it's so unbelievably profound to think that like these proteins are being created and somehow the cell knows when I say no, right? But somehow the physics of a cell and the way things are set up, mm. it's going to stay chemistry. here. It's going to interact with that. Based or, on the property of the protein. Yeah. I, I just it's find a that system. to be, it's, it's, un, a, it's yeah. remarkable. And, and everything is reliant on the step before. That's the thing. There's all these yeah. steps that teach other steps to do. But yeah, you're right. I mean, this is Sagan, right? When he's talking about molecular machines and he's like, holy crap. Like, yeah. this is mind-blowing stuff. We are grabbing stuff. a hold of the molecular machinery of life. Yeah. But it's, it, but it it's doing it without a mind. It's doing, yeah, it's just, so it's just chemistry playing itself it's out. Like, yeah. It's just really complicated chemistry. Let me finish mm-hmm. what, what they actually yeah, did. So often the way the genes turned off is through methylation, which is just, you know, you, you have methyl groups bind to it. And also you could bind it up in the histone. So histones are proteins very highly conserved that basically coil up DNA. DNA is a really, really, really long molecule. You want them to coil them up into nice manageable chromosomes. The histones do that. Um, we have the same histones that, like, bananas do, right? Like, pretty much all life has the same, pretty well, the same, similar, if not identical, histones. Very okay. highly conserved. if your histones get messed up, you're done. Yeah, it's just it's inc- incompatible with life, so that's <laughs> yeah, why they don't okay exist. What they wanted to do was target a gene and then turn off a protein that silences the gene, right? That's responsible for binding it up in such a way that it doesn't get expressed. So they want to inhibit inhibition. Yes. Okay. Right. So they want to block the, the inhibiting protein, the mm-hmm. silencing protein. So they said, okay, so we're going to take CRISPR. Remember, CRISPR is, you remember what the acronym is? And I never I remember. Know. I used to know it so well. Clustered. Re- palindromic repeat. Regularly, regularly. regularly interspaced. Regularly. Palindrome. Pal- short palindromic repeat. repeat. I, I had to do right. a couple of those letters. Clustered. <laughs> Regularly interspaced short, short palindromic repeats. I even like remember when Steve embarrasses me on the show. Like, Bob, what does CRISPR mean? Like, oh, I forget. And I, I wrote it out. I'm looking. I got to remember it next time Steve says this on the show. <laughs> and that was three months ago. Now, of course, I forgot. But really, think it's about hard that. To keep but I also <laughs> love these kinds of names in science. These kinds of names. I love that we've moved into this type of nomenclature in science. Used to be, especially in like anatomy and physiology, things were like named for the people that yeah. discovered them. You're like, that mm. is, there's no meaning in that. Right. And no then value. we did the whole thing with Latin, which is great if you know Latin. And that can really be very helpful. You should learn Latin if you're trying to learn about physiology. But when it comes to like, okay, clustered, you said regularly, regularly interspaced, interspaced, short, short palindromic, palindromic repeats. repeats. It, it tells you exactly what you're looking Doesn't for. Doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> <laughs> but remember that DNA short, is letters. Is, yeah. It's just a series of letters, a base pair. Yeah, I get that. And, and so you know these are clustered. I, I it's the same forward and backwards. Sure. Yeah, yeah. and so right. these are clustered. Right they are regularly interspaced. They are they're, short. They're short. They are palindromic, and they repeat. They repeat, yeah. Okay. All right. No, but you do get that. Jay, come on, you right. get it. That's what so. astronomy needs. I, I get annoyed with the I know. It's number great. designation. Now, it's great. What does the CRISPR itself do? It basically, you insert a genetic sequence into the, this CRISPR, you know, these the palindrome repeats, and then it will go to, it'll find the matching sequence in a genome. Yeah. Right. So this is a way of targeting the sequence in the genome that you want. Down to just a few letters. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, really, really specific. Yeah. But it doesn't do anything. It just finds it. Yeah, but then it, you have to cut. But it has to deliver a payload. It's like a so that's Google like, Maps. It takes yeah, you to the it spot. takes you there, but <laughs> it doesn't do anything. So, so you, often you may have heard like CRISPR-Cas9. What's the Cas9? That's the payload. Cas9 is, is scissors, right? So it will, it'll splice the genome wherever the CRISPR takes it. So the CRISPR takes it to the sequence, and then the Cas9 slices it. I and have you, a great way to describe this. Yeah? You, you guys know that Santa Claus that grows up the chain? And then he goes down the chain. You ever have one of those hanging in your house? Yeah. The chain is the DNA. A, and, and Santa, Santa Claus is CRISPR. is CRISPR as he's, like, yeah. you know, as he's reading That's, it. Yeah, sure. Except he pulls out a pair of scissors. That's the Cas9. That's the yeah. Cas9. Horrible right. analogy. <laughs> <laughs> What's the Santa on a chain? I know, we know. There's, there's a, it's a, it's like is a, that like Elf on a it's Shelf? It's like a toy. It's like, it looks like Santa, and he's got like these hands that go like this, but the chain is, is going through his so body. So you have to know this Santa, like Santa like toy. Okay. Chain, and then when it gets to the top, it, it, some mechanism gets triggered, and it, and it climbs back down. Oh. If you're spending that much time explaining your analogy, it probably didn't help. <laughs> but anyway. that time to CRISPR. Anyway. <laughs> So, but there could be other payloads that do other things, right? And if you want to insert a gene, then you've got to repair the, the, the uh, cut in such a way that you insert the new gene. It gets more complicated. Yeah. But We've got Cas9, Cas X. Yeah, Cas10, Cas12. Yeah, 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 but anyway, if you just want to destroy the gene, there you go. Or if you just want to kill the cell, you could cut, punt, slice it up a bunch of ways. So, like, they're making CRISPR to go around. Finding sequences that are unique to cancer cells, yes. splice them up and kill the cancer cells. Really, it's working out well. What these guys did was they, they changed the sequence of the Cas9 so it doesn't work. And they called that D-Cas9 for dead Cas9, right? Uh-huh. So now you have CRISPR, 
with an inactive Cas9 attached to it. Why did they do that? Because they want the Cas9 to basically be a connector. Then they attach a, a protein to the DCAS9, which is like now your new payload, okay. which is a protein that is designed to block a receptor, the receptor protein that they want to block. So you're finding yeah. on the DNA the repeating sequence. Yep. You're bringing the scissors, but instead of snipping, you're like sticking them there. And then you're sticking something to it. Yeah, but they're, you're using it just as a payload mm -hmm. with connectors. So think about like if you're assembling a rocket, you have yeah. your engine and you have your assembly thing and then you have your capsule, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the same kind of thing. So essentially what it, this is... Wait, so that was more descriptive and better than Santa Claus? Absolutely. Way more. <laughs> so he's got a rocket, you know, rocket, rocket, and then there's the payload on top. That's CRISPR. <laughs> so it's not CRISPR. It's CRISPR plus the dead Cas9 plus the payload. So now, what's the, the payload, payload again? The payload is a, is a protein right. that was designed with artificial intelligence, right? Okay. So they have an AI designed protein. They make me a protein that will block this receptor. Mm -hmm. They take that protein, they attach it to the dead Cas9, which is attached to the CRISPR, which finds the sequence they want to reactivate. They, they introduce it and it turns the gene on. Oh, so it's not about the specific receptor, it's about the function. We're not talking about blocking a specific receptor. No, yeah, right. We're talking about the fact that this could this would block work for any yeah, gene. That's cool. That's why you need the CRISPR to tell you which yeah. gene to turn on. Gotcha, right? gotcha, so the, gotcha. the CRISPR targets the gene. Cast the dead Cas9 is just a connector, mm -hmm. and now you have the AI built designer protein which blocks the thing on that gene to turn the gene on, and cool. it worked. About a third of the cells that they exposed to it got had their genes this target gene turned on. So what's that's a probably pretty good. What's a practical application? So the, like, the ideally, most, the most immediate application is. Just research. We want to study what that gene does. So we turn it on, and now we know what protein it's making. We know what it's doing. Right. right? So just it's a way of just supercharging genetics research. Okay. Right. But, of course, you could think about therapeutics. If you have, for example, a mutation that means you underproduce a protein, you could then you know, activate, you know, activate genes to produce more of that protein to counteract the genetic disease, for example. Steve, could we use that to, to make genes make a protein that we want to use in other applications? Like, I want to, I need a protein. Yeah, like, sure. Like you for want, medicine or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bunch of this particular protein. Yeah, you yeah. have an animal model. Like or a, yeast, yeast or bacteria or something. Yeast. Yeah, just crank up this gene so that we make what we want it to produce. But the thing that I liked about this story, again, this particular application was not really, for me, that was not the lead of this story. The lead of the story is we have a modular designer CRISPR system mm -hmm. that could do whatever we want. You yeah. know, that's the key. They figured out how to make a designer, right? Because they could design whatever payload they want. Mm -hmm. Modular, because they just could just attach these things together, and, and using CRISPR to target whatever gene that we need. Wow. I mean, the um, yeah. So the, now you could just think about that. We could, you know, do what you could target any gene for, and, and whatever you design to attach to that payload could do whatever. But we it's need. important to note. That you can't just like inject this into someone and have it happen throughout their whole body. Well, that's right? not. That's a different issue. Yeah. That's a, so that, that that's the vector, right? Yeah. So the vector is how we get this, the CRISPR system, to whatever, the cell. to the cell. Now, if you're doing it in a petri dish, it's easy, right? So for research, you're done, right? If you're doing it on blood or something, you could take out of the body and put back into in the body. Vitro, you're good. Yeah. What about yeah, a tumor um, in bone, the body? But mm. that's where things get weird. Tumor, you could inject it. That's that's easier if it's a solid okay, tumor. That's true. But um, also, this wouldn't really. I mean, well, this might be interesting for a, for a tumor suppressor gene, not necessarily for an oncogene. For oncogenes, you want to turn them off. Exactly. Yeah, but tumor suppressors, is... you want to turn off. Yeah, yeah. So it could be, yeah, one, one half of how we treat cancer. But they, but they use CRISPR to, to treat somebody's eyes. Like it, yeah, it was yeah. a, fully, a fully grown organ, right. and they were able to... But then to... you have to use, like, a viral vector. Yeah. The retroviruses are one way, but there's a couple other newer methods that are probably better. That, but there's the, the, the vector... We talked about this before on the show. That's a separate issue. That's part of this whole system, though, is being able to deliver this to, to which cells you want to get them yeah. to. And, and do you think that that is a, an incredibly big hurdle, or you think we can we'll solve no, that pretty it, soon? It's a hurdle, but we're solving it already. It's partially solved. And so also, if you only want to target some cells and not other cells, yeah, yeah that gets complicated because the body is. You know, CRISPR is not perfect. There's offsite targeting. You know, it's not. We also figured out how to like speed it up or slow it down, make it fast and inaccurate and slow and accurate. So we're sort of That's the, good. the technology is on the steep part of the curve. This is a whole system of controlling genetics that every couple of weeks we see another CRISPR, you know, tweak or thing that they figured out about it. It's but amazing. for the most part, it is a research paradigm right yeah. now. Like, we have some clinical well, applications, but yeah, it's... Yeah, there's yeah. some clinical applications, but it's supercharging genetics, genetics yeah. research. George, then, CRISPR, <laughs> underrated, overrated? <laughs> <laughs>
I'd say properly rated. <laughs> I would say properly rated. It's, Steve, un it's underrated. By those in the know. It's underrated, Steve, it's Leap underrated by most Leap people. Leap ahead 50 years. What, what do you think we could probably do with this? I mean, 50 years is hard to tell. I mean, it's... What did we say in our book? I know. Basically, well, right? it, 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 personalized it, medicine. Yeah. I think that's probably the okay. most umbrella That's always the thing use. that the reporters yeah. are going to say about it. This will lead to personalized medicine. But if you really think about it... Answer. But it's true. It's true. Like it's, it's understanding a genetic disease that's personal. Like, especially when I think of cancer, such a good model for that. Because cancer is not one thing. And it's not even lots of things. Breast cancer in and of itself is not one thing. Because there's HER2 positive and there's yeah, HER2 yeah. negative. And, there's, and so understanding one person's disease model genetically and then targeting their treatments, for it, which we're getting better and better at, but we're still doing it at a chemical level. Yep. But being able to do it really at like a molecular level, I think, yeah. would be really The two questions I want answered are, is CRISPR going to be able, are we going to use CRISPR to design you know, ba you babies. Know, babies, where they're just going to... Well, that's an ethics more, issue. Yeah. Right. Just so because it's we already can. been done. Right. Yeah, right. just because yeah. we can't do it. Right. Yeah, it can. Just, it's it's already been done. Yeah. Remember we can the, do the, it. Dr. Hay, the right. Chinese guy, did it. Yeah. And then the second thing is, is this go? Is CRISPR going to be used on living people to extend life? Well, again, it's hard to talk about specific applications because that... that Saying, what exactly are you going to change in the genome to do that? And life extension is a function of disease mitigation. I mean, that's a big how. That's how. But we've let me tell you this. Life. Yeah. This is yeah, what I will yes, tell you. Yeah. I can't. It's hard to answer specific questions about fifty years or specific applications. But I will say that, like, definitely over the rest of this century and beyond, very rapidly we are gaining greater and greater control over the genome, yep. the fundamental code right. of life. To the point, you know, where our ability to control it is already profound compared to like where we were 10 years ago, 20 years right. ago, 50 years. It's already massively profound, but it's going to get only even Profounder. more profound. Yeah. <laughs> to the point where mm. we're going to have near total control over genetics. And, uh, in a, in a way, it's not just that we can do it. We can do it quickly, cheaply, designer, yeah. modular. This, like it's just there. You, just, you plug into the computer. This is what I want. Pfft, there you the go. The limits will be ethical in nature. Yeah, it'll be only right. yeah, it'll be ethical be, right. and and sort of basic knowledge about what stuff does. But we're sorting right. that out. Right. You know, Steve, very, this very I think this is one of the most important advances. That one of like the top three and most important advances in the past generation. Yeah, the CRISPR and all CRISPR just CRISPR and all the related. Yeah, we used to say CRISPR is kind of like CRISPR is like the is like. CRISPR did for like molecular biology what PCR did, but I think it surpassed oh PCR God. tons. But there's no comparison. The there is though. Is, you is, really don't understand what laboratory work was like before PCR. Oh, I, I <laughs> PCR was massive. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine. PCR is a great tool, but mm. Chris, it doesn't. Com the, it doesn't the have effect. the outcome. Sorry. It doesn't have the outcome. I would think yeah, yeah. the only thing that would beat this would be nanotechnology. Like like. The promise of nanotechnology. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I read a lot of science fiction. This is science fiction right here, the CRISPR. It's amazing. It's, it's just it's an amazing advance, it's, and it's accelerating it because it's so cheap challenge. and anybody can do this. It's going to challenge our concept of what it is to be human, of what is life, mm -hmm. and it's going to challenge the ethics of our technology. In a, in a century, everything is going to be different because just because of CRISPR. And, and you're not even adding the other technologies, AI, quantum computers, that are going to that are going well, to also interact and that's drive the thing. things the, crazy. They're just this alone, the in fact that years, we are not, our society is not going to be recognizable, in my opinion. Yeah, we wrote a book about it it's coming out this <laughs> yeah. fall. It's no, it's true. I mean, you think about it, and, and more and more we're reading news items about, and they, of course, they used AI to design the thing, which would have taken years previously. Now they just said. Bank me a protein that binds to this receptor, and boom, there it is. Yeah. I mean, that's just amazing that, that they could do that. So it's just, it is underrated, George. This whole oh this, this is going <laughs> this is going to change the world in ways that we do not have not currently wrapped our head around. Yeah. It's already happening. And again, it's going to be that thing where like um, we're hyping it now, and ten years from now, you go, what happened? All that stuff Steve said was going to happen. In general, the short-term progress is a lot slower than you think it is, but then it inflects, and the long-term progress is orders of magnitude greater than you think it is. We, we are on the inflection point right now. And, yeah, it'll be five, ten years, and the world may not look different, but you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years now, you're going to turn around and go, total change. Well, to, and we also won't to, to real, necessarily, some people might not realize the difference because, you know, for, for many, like, regular consumers of medicine, for example, yeah. or of technology, like, what happens inside of the machine we're not privy yeah, to. it's a black box. And I think for this, too, it's like, we'll see all these amazing outcomes, but we won't realize that was all because the late, of CRISPR. The yeah, person yeah. won't realize that yeah. CRISPR made this possible. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, everyone, we're going to take a quick break from our show to talk about one of our sponsors this week, Bombas. Steve, Bombas' mission is simple. Make the most comfortable clothing ever and match every item sold with an equal item donated. That's awesome. 
So when you buy Bombas, you are also giving to someone in need. Bombas design their socks, shirts, and underwear to be the clothes you can't wait to put on every day. Yeah, they're super soft. They're made out of things like merino wool and pima cotton and even cashmere. Um, seamless, tagless, so, so, so comfortable. And I love that there are options for every style you can imagine. So, you know, when I buy my Bomba socks, I'm thinking about, are these the socks I'm going to work out in? Are these the socks I'm going to wear with um, shorts, with pants, with whatever? You can literally find anything that you need. And of course, Socks, underwear, and t-shirts are the three most requested clothing items at homeless shelters, which is why Bombas donates one for every item you buy. Go to bombas.com slash skeptics and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash skeptics for 20% off your first purchase. Bombas.com slash skeptics. All right, guys, let's get back to the show. All right, let's move on. Bob, you're going to tell us, recently you told us about plasma lenses. Now you're going to tell us about X-ray lenses. Yeah. You got lenses. Oh, I got those on the back of the comic book, you know. (laughs) Right? You sign $2. Yeah, but but in between then, Steve, I talked about an anti-universe, which is really cool. But I'm not talking about that today. So so scientists have made recently made a breakthrough of creating the first X-ray achromatic lens. And I read that. I'm like, okay, so why is that such a big breakthrough? I I mean, I know what, you know, chromatic, achromatic, kind of knows, I know what that word means, but, but an achromatic x-ray lens, why, why is that something that is dramatic? And it, and it really kind of is dramatic. Now, an achromatic lens or an achromat, achromat, essentially is great for making I- imagery. It, it focuses different frequencies together, either on a, at a point or on a plane, instead of having all the different frequencies kind of disperse out. If so you have an expensive camera, you have an achromatic lens in it, yeah. so you don't get chromatic aberration. Right. I tried to find out if like iPhones have it, and they don't. I mean, you could probably get an attachment, but it's, it it's basically gives you superior image imaging. So it's it's really important. Now we've had achromatic lenses for optical imagery for two hundred years. Two hundred years, we we've basically had this technology, and what it does is, it, I mean, what's happening is this: you have two different lenses. One, say. For example, concave and convex, you put them together. The first lens disperses the light, kind of like a prism. The second lens focuses it all into a point or in a plane. Whereas without, if you just had the one lens, the different frequencies of light, like the blue would focus here, the red would focus here, and then so you get a, you wouldn't get a superior image. The focal point would spread out based with frequency. Right, exactly. Right, so this brings it all so, to one point. So, um, and you can get, say, 200 nanometer uh, optical resolution, which is, which is good, which is really good. But that's, so that's, what, how, that's the situation with an optical achromatic lens. Now, X-ray chroma- chromatic lens, achromatic lens, that could focus to 20 nanometers. So in order, you have an order of magnitude greater optical res- resolution. You could zoom in on stuff and see amazing details with it. And you could also, it's, it's an X-ray. You could see inside, in some substances, you can see inside it as well. So this is, you know, an, an amazing te- imaging technology that you could use. But, but just to clarify, though, yes. is this for actually taking just regular pictures? It, yeah. Pictures, high resolution images of the, of the, of the, the, the nano world, the, the micro world, the, the really small images, high resolution images of tiny things that an optical, that optical imaging can't really do. Can you can you give me a comparison like 4K, 6K, 8K, or do you have any idea like where? It's, it's more the resolution, the pixel size. Go, it would go from 200 to 20. Oh, oh so yeah. so 200 yeah. nanometers to 20 nanometers. Yeah. Yeah. So right. nanometers, billionth of a meter, right. super super so that, tiny. That's that's hugely yeah. more yeah. sharp. It is. It's an it's, order it's, of magnitude. It's yeah. a gr- it, it would yeah. be a great tool, but we said. don't oh, have an. Yeah. A, there's no achromatic. Why am I looking at them? There's no achromatic <laughs> X-ray lens. They don't exist, and that's because there's no. They couldn't find two materials that you could then stick together that are different enough that could disperse the X-rays and then focus them down. They, those two materials, like the concave and convex lens, just they don't. They didn't exist. So what you had to do, if you wanted to take a a high resolution X-ray you know, Im- image, you'd have to go to like a lab or something and go to a synchrotron which was basically super bright x-ray source, very, very bright. And then, and then you would use that and you would take your image. But then you would have to filter out all those, all those f- frequencies that were outside of your plane. You'd, focus, you'd filter them out and then you'd, fo- you'd filter those out and you would have just your tiny little frequency, like a monochromatic x-ray image. And, and that would be fine, but it would be very inefficient and it would be dim because you're, t- you're taking away most of the frequencies. You're just focusing on just that one frequency that, that happened to focus because it's monochromatic. And it would be very expensive. Now it would be bright because you had you went to this big synchrotron, and uh, but it would be expensive. 
you, you would have to plan it. You would have to call them and say, all right, I want to take this image. Uh, when can you fit me in? Three months? Like, you know, you can't do quick, nimble research with a device when you're counting on something like that. You need something smaller, cheaper that you could just have in, in your lab, in your, in your company. They didn't exist until these guys started really trying to develop an achromatic X-ray lens. So what they did was they figured out, let's see, they said the trick was to realize that we could position a second refractive lens in front of our diffractive lens. So they, what they did was they had to look at not similar materials, but different optical principles and put them together. So refractive, diffractive, and the other critical component that only recently became available was they did uh, using 3D printing with a special polymer, they were able to create, they were able to build the, the specific lens component that they needed to refract the x-rays. Well, you're, say, you're saying they couldn't do it until 3D printing was able to do it? Yeah, right. They, they couldn't. They, and they had the, the mental breakthrough that you could put the refractive in front of the diffractive, and then they needed to build that refractive piece, or they, they needed to build the component using 3D printing. Wow, they 3D printed something that was... Because 3D printing... You know, it's not super precise like that. Like, I thought lenses had to be, like, molecularly, like, damn near perfect. Right, but so they used, they used two photon, like, lithographic techniques. So this is not, this is not a printer that, that uh, you and uh, Ian are, this, are messing around with yeah. for the SDU. This but it's is still like, using a polymer? Yes. Yeah, so, so, oh, cool. so, and is yeah, it optically clear? Two, well, it's two, well, what's happening is that you, the, I didn't go too deep mm. into that aspect of exactly how the 3D printing aspect worked, but it's basically, it's called two, two photon lithographic, um, laser, like laser designing, and it basically uses that to uh, to harden the polymers, right? So, you, so you shoot the laser to harden the polymer, and that that hardened part is is what is being used in additive manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. And that is so, the most the highest resolution type, right? Basically. And we're, we're talking nanometer resolution. Yeah, yeah. I mean, crazy, crazy resolution. So this really didn't exist until recently. So, so they designed it, built it, and then now when they put that all together, they they proved that they have an achromatic X-ray lens that they can now use to image the nano world um, in very inexpensive, nimble devices that most many companies can now use. So you'll be seeing uh, doing people doing research for microchips, batteries, um, and care, material science, lots of material science research using this now. So this could really just open up a whole new world to researchers to really develop these technologies a lot so faster Bob, than as, before. As an example, like they would look at the innards of a, an old battery, right? Mm -hmm. And they'd use this and they'd, they'd look and say, oh, now we can really see like what's going on inside here. Yeah. That, like they're looking for, this is an information gathering. Right, right. and they thing. could, if they really wanted that information before, they kind of could do that, but it would be slow and expensive, take a lot of time. Here they can be, they could just do it you know, in their lab with the machine that, that they bought or, yeah. or whatever, um, and they wouldn't have to go to these big, these big places. So it's like CRISPR, where now every, lots, every lab can do lots it. Of, every lab can yeah, do CRISPR, cool. and now lots more labs can do this type of, yeah. of research. So awesome. cool, cool stuff. Yeah, I wonder how far off medical applications are. You know, obviously x-rays, you know, yeah. uh, you, mm -hmm. something that's used in medicine. Yep to this day. All right, George, this yeah. is one of those things that sounds sounds simple or not that important, but when you think about it, it, be, it could be really profound. T tell me about cleaning solar panels. Yeah, so oh. solar panels are becoming more and more ubiquitous on the planet. They're estimating that by 2030, uh, about 10% of the planet's power is going to come from solar panels. And solar panels tend to work really well in desert areas because obviously the sun is beaming down much more consistently. And the problem uh, that arises is in desert areas, you tend to have a lot of desert. <laughs> yeah. And that's dusty, and that's sandy, and that starts covering... It's everywhere. It gets, the, yeah. it it gets, gets everywhere. everywhere. It's but this everywhere. is also a problem, like, on Mars. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, like, right. What do right, we right. do once yeah, they get covered right. and they don't work anymore? Right. And so the idea is, well, you have to clean the, so you have to clean the panels somehow. Well, you could... You could develop some kind of brush system that would remove dust and dirt off of the panels. But the panels tend to be of a sort of a sensitive nature, so you can damage them pretty easily if you're physically brushing dirt off of them. It can scratch it. It can do stuff. Plus, you have to sort of have some kind of a device or people to do that. That's why we don't have just, like, wiper blades and, like, the... Like Rain X. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Rain like, X. Yeah. <laughs> Rain X is solar, great, right? but Rain X is basically water. And so to bring water uh. to these solar panels tends to offset the money you're saving by using solar energy. Because yeah. you have to have hundreds and thousands of gallons of water to be brought into these locations. Yeah. And 
And apparently, like you know, like the dust of one month can can affect the the uh, efficiency of a solar panel by like thirty oh, percent, wow. like just within within a month or so. So the uh, the boys at M- MIT, the pe- the people at MIT, the researchers over there at MIT. Uh, we're developing. That's over in New York, right? That's in New York. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can't park anywhere near the place. But it's uh, yeah. they're working on. This is not a new idea, but electrostatic repulsion. Oh. Um, this a idea force of field. Using, <laughs> force field, sort of a force field, uh, sort of. Yeah, uh, it's uh, waterless cleaning. How can we clean these solar panels in a way that's not going to use water, that's not going to use brushes, and that almost most important is not going to touch the panels so as to affect their efficiency or to just screw them up? Well, it's not even really cleaning. It's like pre-clean. It's like prevention. Right? Yeah, I mean, sort like it of. It prevents the dust from sticking to begin with. In, in essence, in yeah. essence. But it can also actually sort of, yeah, oh, cool. remove it to remove a certain extent. Remove it there. They use it intermittently. So they, there's, there have been systems developed where they've tried to interlace into the, into the meshing of the panel some kind of electrostatic system that basically puts a charge in it that doesn't let dust sort of settle on it. The problem is that tends to lend, let uh, moisture in because you've got this moisture barrier that has to be uh, 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 you have to get stuff through so that stuff tends to get affected then by water. Yeah. So the, the, the crews at MIT developed this touchless system, which in essence is a metal bar that kind of, if you picture a solar panel and picture a thin metal bar that then is going to sort of pass over the top of the, of the entire panel, that it sets up this charge and can remove dust that's there by doing this electrostatic repulsion. So it's not in it, it's above it. It's above it. It's okay. not touching it. So it never actually touches it never really touches the screen. So in practice, each solar panel it's fitted with a railing on each side with an electrode spanning across the panel, right? Mm-hmm. A small electric motor Maybe using some of the some of the energy that's in the solar panel itself yeah. would drive. Would that be away. funny if it wasn't a solar panel? That's right, yeah. <laughs> it's like you got to put a battery. In. That's right. Yeah, it's, it, it runs on on, on <laughs> kerosene and gas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's diesel. Yeah. So we've got this little diesel this little bike. belt system. It moves the electrode from one end to the other, and it causes all the dust to fall away. So the whole process could be automated or controlled remotely. Uh, ultimately, thin strips of conductive transparent materials could be permanently arranged above the panel eliminating the need for moving parts. So not only could you have a thing that's moving sort of doing it, but if you can get sort of translucent or transparent mm-hmm. material that can carry a charge, you set that on top of it, you never actually touch the panel, and it removes all yeah, the dust. Cool. And they're so saying it doesn't interfere with the uh, effectiveness of the... And that's it, yeah. And once you've removed, once you've removed the sand and the dust and all the all the Anakin material that's there, uh-huh. you're you're <laughs> good to go. And so you can save, you know, what, what are the numbers here? A 1% reduction in power. For a 150 megawatt solar installation, which is not a huge installation, but it's a pretty decent sized one, it's like two hundred thousand dollars a year you lose just from just one percent. One percent, and you said the dust often is thirty percent. It can it affects wow. them thirty percent in just in just a month. So, yeah. if you can change this globally, three to four percent reduction in power output, that's like billions of dollars, Gosh, three yeah. to five wow. billion dollars. Yeah. So it's this simple sort of thing. So they're going to try to start having this work across. It's one of these uh, again. You have to so think of every potential problem of a solution that you may have. Like, we'll put up solar panels. Great. Oh, dust. Oh, crap. You know? Yeah. Well, this and is the, where our discussion of solar roads, remember? We came up oh, with so right. many ways in which the solar yeah. roads were just not going to work. Ridiculous. From right. basic Dumbest practical. Dumbest idea ever, solar roads. <laughs> George. Wait. I think I think in LA they did like a solar or maybe not LA like a but bike somewhere path or something? Uh, no Oregon. solar river was it Oregon solar river it was like oh, these solar river. these things that they floated on top of the water oh, which is kind of cool yeah yeah it's like yeah, yeah. Well, don't you don't have to drive on top of it exactly <laughs> <laughs> what right? could go wrong there <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is what I loved about this news item is again it's the idea that sometimes these simplest little problems can torpedo an otherwise yeah. stellar technology yes. and we don't realize problem, that though. here's a problem here's a solar panel. Here's another solar panel. Right you want to yep. describe so, verbally what you're doing? Right? <laughs> yeah, so we'll, uh, For the audio uh, podcast? Two solar panels that are kind of facing each other. So this one electrostatically repels the dust and it goes, and it lands here. Then this one repels it and it goes, and it lands back to no, the original. No, it just floats one. in the it's middle. It's back and forth forever. But I'm then sure they can get a thick of a way Yeah, then we that. figure out how to extract that energy. Ooh. <laughs> Bob, all you have to do is orient all the solar panels towards the sun. <laughs> yeah, why and would you have won't facing happen. like That's this? That's an easy Theoretically, do you think we could put these things in showers so we don't we could just get clean walking? They walk in, you know. Well, I've, I've heard of cars that have electrostatic 
uh, mm. systems that repel dust wow, on really? them. They're like they're like in, in the paint. Or something? Yeah, it's like yeah. it's either in the paint or it's it's in the it's in the surface of it somehow. Sort of done like really high end cars or just portions of cars that are more susceptible to dust and dirt. But Jay, is the reason know? that you need to shower because you're covered in dust? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know when Star, you know when Star well, Trek, kind of they have water just in showers in Star Trek, right? Yeah. I don't know. I don't. Know, but I, I'm, yeah. as you were describing, like this sounds like the waterless showers in Star Trek. Like they get in and like. Bleh, I think we mostly they, shower clean. for bacteria, right? Like well, to reduce oil. the smell. Yeah, yeah. But I think yeah. it's you know from so a hygiene that, perspective. So would lift oil too? You think? No, it's no. particulate matter. It's, just part- it's yeah. dry particulate matter. Okay, I right. think. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Just neat. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, solar energy is going to be massively important, and you know, it is already, and increasingly so. You know, it is you know one of those game-changing technologies. And again, like the last twenty years, I remember we first doing the show, we we're talking about solar. I think the average efficiency of a commercial solar panel at that time was like twelve percent. Wow. And here we are, you know, a decade later, it's twenty percent, twenty-two percent. We're probably going to hit thirty. Percent by like the mid 2030s or Are so. Are you happy that you have your roof full of totally. solar? Yeah, it's worked out for you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just basically just knocked 20 percent off my solar bill. And I think we're yeah. seeing municipal change. Like, like in LA, there was a while where it was like, unless you were grandfathered in, new builds had to have um, reflective roofs, mm-hmm. like white mm-hmm. white painted roofs. And now there is a new initiative after a certain year, and I think it's coming up soon. All new builds have to have, have, solar. To have solar. It's just part yeah. of the build plan. Oh, nice. Why not? Yeah. I like the white. The white roofs is so it's such so a no brainer. I, I love that the new well, UPS the trucks. Buses, all yeah, yeah school buses and UPS trucks yeah. all have white roofs as well. Yeah, because that that you know affects it just a little bit. So it, a lot, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a whole fleet of trucks. Yeah. All right, Kara, tell us about the effect of having a free media on democracy. Yeah, so I think this, this goes back to it, your right. freedom of speech. Really relates right. back to yeah, our kind of unplanned and uh, I think important conversation at the beginning. Two researchers, Victor Picard and Picard. Neff, uh, Timothy Neff, they have been doing research for quite some time. Sort of their bread and butter in their area is like democracy and media, and sort of how do they relate to one another. And they recently did um, an interesting study where, and, and Victor Picard, by the way, is the I love his title. He's the um, whatever, C. Edwin Baker, Professor of Media Policy and Political Economy and Co-Director of the Media Inequality and Change Center at Annenberg. Um, CRISPR. Yeah, CRISPR. (laughs) (laughs) Um, They are proposing, based on their research, that one of the ways to counteract some of the struggles that we have been seeing, especially here uh, in America with our democracy, and especially the struggle with the fact that we have this phenomenon of basically news deserts. Like, we've heard of food deserts. We see news deserts. Like, local newspapers have shuttered across the country. And so you see more, like, corporate media kind of trying to take over, but we're not seeing a, a, a very large local response. And, and also a, a massive spread, as we know, we talk about this all the time on the show, of misinformation, of disinformation. And so these researchers, uh, based on many of their studies, but, but this also most recent study, are sort of kind of speaking out for the role that government-funded media can have. So they did a study called Funding Democracy, Public Media and Democratic Health in 33 Countries. And they looked at um, the Economist Democracy Index, and they looked across their seven global regions, and they specifically only focused on democracies, but they wanted to look at um, a range from full democracies to flawed democracies, which were all ranked by the economists. So they kind of had this, these standards already worked out. They didn't want to look at authoritarian regimes at all. Want to look at functional democracies, um, but, but from full to flawed. And then they looked at their democratic rankings and they correlated those. They compared those to their levels of public media funding. But also they looked at regulatory structures which allow for a free press. Right, allow for independence in journalism. Um, and they found that, I mean, as you might expect, really robust public media is very predictive of functional democracy. But what they also found was that America is a deep outlier in that we do not fund public media at all. We're talking... Okay, what about NPR and... Yeah, that, that accounts for 0.002% of our gross domestic product, which which uh, amounts to about $1.40 per capita. And by the way, we... So it's not at all. But when I say at all, get this, $1.40 per capita, while places like the U, like UK, Norway, and Sweden spend close to 100 or more per capita. Yeah. It's 
abysmal. So it's very we are a massive outlier when they, when they look at all of their statistics. Yeah. We're like way over here. But we also have the highest GDP. So mm-hmm. the country with the highest GDP among these flawed to functional democracies is spending the lowest amount of money on public media. Um, and sadly, we also know that we um, now are ranked within the Economist Democracy Index as a flawed democracy. Mm-hmm. We, we are falling in, in that area. We're no longer a full democracy. We're didn't a flawed that, democracy. Didn't we cross the line after January 6th? Wouldn't be surprised if it happened in, yeah, yeah. Several, yeah, I mean, in the last no several years. No surprise there. You know what I yeah, mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. Their research looks at the correlation between strong public media and strong democracy, but they're obviously looking at the larger body of literature, and there is a lot of literature that shows a correlation between um, uh, strong public media and um, a well-informed political culture, high support for democratic processes, increased levels of civic engagement. These are all like outcome variables that they find in societies where there's a large funding into public media. How do they define public media? Is that news source or is there, are we talking full public media? Full public broadcast, news, like, like whether But even art support and stuff like that? Media, or is, though. I think it's, so just no, media. I think okay. specifically like um, – Information. information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spread, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, they, yeah, mostly they're, I think they're looking at like print and broadcast okay. news and maybe probably also, um, what do you call it? Like I worked for PBS, or I, ha- I still do work for PBS, but I've done several shows at PBS KCET in, in the SoCal uh, market. We also do, it's like public affairs. It's not always news, but sometimes it's kind of like what's happening in your community. Right. Um, and they're showing that there are these outcome measures across the board that, that are highly predictive. And of course, there are, there's some pushback that you see. Um, so one of, in, in the write-up that I was looking at, one of the questions, which I think is a legitimate question, is like, uh, what are some of the criticisms? Because I think a lot of people, especially in the U.S., and th- they actually said, especially in the U.S., you see this like resistance to fund a lot of public media because of a fear of state-sponsored media, yeah. right? Because of it's course we've seen this, media. and yeah. that's the thing. It, you have to have both. You have to have the the public funding, the monies available, and then an independent media being able to use those funds yeah. to utilize good journalistic practices and and uh, inform the electorate. And the mm-hmm. problem is, you know, obviously with the, and they don't talk about this, but with the fairness doctrine, like with the changes that we've seen basically since the Reagan administration on, there have been, and then with the fact that we've sort of got a corporate uh, structure to our media. So the stories that make the most money are the stories that rise to the top, which is fundamentally incompatible mm-hmm. very often with informing the electorate. Um, we have very good scientific data to show that if we put more money into public media, we will have a healthier, literally a healthier democracy. Yeah, um, yeah and they're I mean, good it's, hard, it's hard to that. deny that. I mean, we have to say this is correlational data. Of course. And you can make a reasonable argument that healthy democracies are more likely to fund. Absolutely. It goes media, both, right? it, it, it goes probably both very ways. likely yeah. goes both ways. Yeah, so it's not, not, not causal. It, yeah, exactly. But, I but mean, the you know, correlation is very strong. It's strong. Yeah, it's and very lots, predictive. There's lots of other supporting data as well. Like, you know, my favorite news show is PBS, you know, like the News Hour, or whatever, because it's just the best quality. You know, just, also, Frontline is my favorite television show of all time, which is yeah. a documentary series on PBS. It's, and, oh, it's so good. But, and, when you, and when you look at the data, like, they've, but you could rank news outlets based upon their objectivity and et cetera. Yeah, you can find those, those things online. And the, the PBS, ones. you know, NPR ones always rank the best. And, and what's know? the other one? BBC World News, which yeah. is also publicly funded, uh, but publicly in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, uh, what's, the, what's the negative? Like, yeah, if this isn't true, let's say, if there isn't a correlation between these two, what's the, what's the negative of, of funding public media? Like very, the, just the, just the money, just the just the money the you money. might yeah. say, And that's right? always money. the argument, and that's, and that's why I think it's been chipped away and chipped absolutely. away and chipped away. But couldn't we buy more and What's that money going towards tanks. instead of going... <laughs> couldn't right, we buy exactly. more like, warplanes? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kara, yeah. yeah. yeah, I don't know if you know the numbers, but like... Are we talking like what would it cost a year? Like we need a billion Well, like dollars? I said, it was... Uh, I only know it at a per capita number, so we would have to... To write that out. Oh, hundred no, times I have the number. I have the number. Uh, last times. year, twenty no, two years ago, twenty twenty, we paid four hundred sixty five million dollars for federal. That's nothing for 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 media. So for public media, forty six so billion wow. annual. So yeah, would you have to go? It would have to go pretty high. Well, guess. they're talking to most other functional democracies more. are two orders of magnitude more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but still, that's nothing. I mean, that's the thing when it comes to our huge. Again, that's point zero zero two percent. Of our GDP, mm-hmm. we spend more of that funding NASA. We and we all argue that it's like if we could only do another half a percent for NASA because that's 05 percent, right? Yeah. Um, but like, think about how public media impacts, impacts 
Everyone, yeah, sure literally everyone. And the other thing is, we because we talked about like, the free speech thing. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about taking something away. Right. We're no, about it's adding additive. something. Yeah, it's like just giving people more information. Yeah. And again, but it's absolutely critical that the funding and the, is separate from you know, the they, independent media, and that's the thing. of course. We, it's not state-run media. And in these measures, we already do that. Know, we have a we strong already, independent you know, public media. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. NPR, PBS, we think about like Sesame Street. We think yeah. about all of these different initiatives, children's television workshop. Did you guys see that documentary about Sesame Street? Ugh. So, good. so I know. stinking good. Watch I know. it. Yeah, it's, it's really good. So it's really what good. made it so good? Yeah, it's it just tells about the origin story and the hurdles and like what their mission was. And it's beautiful. The, the consistency of the effort and the encouragement of not just creativity, but creativity in the guise of informing children in the best way that children can be informed about what they need to learn. And reaching the kids who nobody considered reaching. Like, their whole intention to Sesame Street was to reach kids in urban centers. Like, it was like, we need to reach kids who live in the city, Mm -hmm. who are very often forgotten, who are very often not spoken. People, you know, kids of color, kids who are uh, coming from, like, a wide variety of backgrounds. But but also the the pointedness of it, of, like, we're going to have these puppets, and they're going to be multicolored, so that they're not... And it's not even that they're, that they would be Caucasian puppets or whatever, but this yeah. idea of like, we're gonna mix it up from the very beginning and, and have, uh, them interact and their and their characters. It's just like yeah, it was so like, well thought yeah, out. We have a puppet that's society. dealing with homelessness. Yeah. We have a puppet that's dealing yeah. with a, a parent who died. We have a puppet. You know, it's very yeah. Like when when, when real uh, issues kids deal with. Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Rogers. Rupert. Uh, oh. Hooper. Mr. Sorry. Hooper died. Yeah. When Mr. Yeah, Hooper died. That was a beautiful. Scene. You know, when yeah. Mr. Hooper died. And a cast say, member died. The cast member died. The guy that played Mr. Hooper died. And it's like, how are we going to? You know, do we do we say something? We're not saying. And they're like, yes, we're going to talk about. And so Big Bird has to be taught that when a person dies. They go, they're gone. They're forever. not coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh it's my beautiful. god, it's amazing. Did they get into how much did Jim Henson have to do with everything? Everything. <laughs> everything. He was huge. Like, it's, yeah. It was him, and then two of the executives that worked. I forget the executives' names, wow. but that they saw what he was trying to do, and they said, "You know what? Here's free reign." And for thirty years, he did it. Like for whatever, 28, 30 years. This is like his greatest it's, it's, it's his doing absolute it. Yeah, but it was his l- baby. Like he loved you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. All he did. And he kept Mr. saying, Rogers. like, kids are smart. Yeah. They will get this. Yeah. They will understand it. If we, they will, they will appreciate the humor. And not just that, the kids will appreciate the humor. The parents will appreciate the humor. So they're not going to go ape shit as yeah. they're watching this stuff time yeah. and time it's again. Not they can, it's bright, you know. They can. It's just watch yeah. it. It's, it's called right. And that's the thing about called, public media too is that it's stratified in that way. You know, good robust public media is reaching people at different. Age, it's right. helping them learn, but it's also helping them c- be critical thinker. Yeah. I mean, these are the goals, yeah, like yeah. the same things we do in the skeptic community. I think our fundamental goal. When was this cut? Was it was this a community. was this a a, a a slow decrease of funding, or was there a, was there a time that it was like well, oh, the, all of a the sudden the fairness doctrine big, right that was had a big huge. Chunk. I mean, that was a massive cliff, right. and then I think it just pushed and pushed. less and less and less. Yeah, and this yeah, idea yeah. of like oh, we're 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 providing funds for Maplethorpe, basically. but it used to you be know, literally required that a certain percentage of airtime was dedicated to purely educational or informational right. content, right. and then once that was repealed, it was like what makes us the most money? Right. You know, yeah. the the news used to be a money loser, and the programming funded the news, and once that. That was disem- oh, disassembled. It became really problematic. Once the news was a profit center. And that's, so that that's the late 70s, then when right? It Early 80s. 80s. It was Reagan. 80s. Reagan. That created was Reagan. a feedback yeah. loop where it's like, well, what gets the most clicks, eyeballs, views, and it's outrage. And that is now and, the model for social and, media. Yes. Like, that is the Facebook. And the not Twitter just social model. media. Like, Fox News. But also, Fox yes. News, is new, their, their business model is keep our audience as maximally outraged as possible. And let's be fair. To and some extent, it's also the model of MSNBC and CNN. Yeah, 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 and yeah, like yeah. every, it's all profit-driven, yeah. right? It's What are we going to talk about? And the things that keep the eyeballs glued outraged. to the TV. Yeah. You, know, you know, dividing people, creating... You know, targets. I mean, it's yeah, just yeah. These things are going to engage with. They're going to demonizing the other side, fear. whatever it is. Fear. fear, culture war. That's what we're living through. We're living through the this feedback loop of media making money off of outraging us about everything and each other. So, and mm-hmm. why is it so hard to just communicate what you just said? To people who are being affected by the media this way, like because like, they say, yeah, you're the right. Point. The other side does do that, right? right. That's what yeah, they exactly. immediately right. say. And also, 
frustrated. But also, that's not the, that's not how you fix the problem. I mean, yes. But oh, oh, you want the government to actually do yeah, something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's funding oh, public it's media yeah. in an evidence-based uh, way. Well, like, look at the data. Right? Start by funding good sources of information. Yeah, yeah, well, at yeah. least daylight savings has been settled. Right, we're good. They did something this year. Stop. That was awesome. No, they actually did something. Yeah, but they did it wrong. Look at partial credit. Stay daylight. And so says every email we keep getting. It's so funny. They're all like, we're going to convert Bob. We get like an email every day about oh, like, we don't want to. Yeah, because the, the be people who agree with us don't bother emailing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a biased sample. <laughs> Self-selective. It's like uh, Yelp reviews. More you you leave, you leave a review when you're pissed. <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone, we're going to take a quick break from our show to talk about one of our sponsors this week, Wondrium. There's this amazing new documentary called Solving for Zero, and it highlights some of the organizations working to fight climate change. Solving for Zero is based on Bill Gates' book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. And I don't know, I found it interesting to learn about the Ocean Bird Project. They're combining modern technology with wind power to cut emissions from massive cargo ships by up to 90%. We recommend you check out Solving for Zero, but it's only available to stream on Wondrium. Wondrium is home to video and audio learning experiences on virtually any topic you can imagine, from science, history, literature, business, the list goes on. These experiences are all presented by teachers, professors, and experts who really know their stuff, and it's always ad-free. Please sign up for Wondrium today and start by checking out Solving for Zero. Wondrium is offering our listeners a free trial of unlimited access to get this offer, you need to visit wondrium.com slash skeptics. Again, that's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash skeptics. All right, guys, let's get back to the show. What's next, Steve? What do we got? All right, next we have Jay. <laughs> Bob's like, I'm done with that. Move on. <laughs> I can Thank see you, he was coming. I saw him scrolling. <laughs> Jay's going to tell us about pareidolia. Pareidolia. So we talk about it all the time. We yeah. love pareidolia. So as a quick reminder, in case you don't fully remember. We like it so much, we have two of them. We do. Pareidolia. <laughs> Pareidolia. <laughs> that's, that's like an Evan joke right there. I love it. <laughs> Pareidolia. Can I go now? <laughs> no. Pareidolia is a type of apophenia. Apophenia is the tendency to perceive patterns and connections between unrelated things that are typically random or ambiguous. And this is, you know, a typical brain function. Like, we all have apophenia happening. If you have too much of it happening, I don't know, if, like, how would you refer to the, having too much apophenia? Hyper, not, hyper apophenia. Seeing significance in random stuff everywhere. But this is an aside. The question right. is, is the problem too much pattern recognition or too little filtering yeah. of what's not meaningful? Yes. But and there can be a pathology. That's an open question. Like, yeah. the people who have paranoid schizophrenia where they see connections everywhere... Is it that they're seeing more connections, or they're just not filtering out yeah. the, all the ones that are not well, meaningful? It could be both. both, both, could be both. Well, exactly. and it's also a lot of other things on top of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But, that's, right. but that, that one question is still an, an area of active research, oh, and wow. I don't know exactly where the balance is right now. But it, bottom line is it's both, but it's probably mainly a filtering problem because we mm. all have the pattern recognition. Uh, could CRISPR fix that? Now, no. That, <laughs> if it is a filtering problem, it does sound like it's something that could be worked on and, and improved upon. With that's critical methods. thinking. That's critical yeah, thinking is the filter. Training. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, that's what therapy is, yeah. right? That, that yeah. is what, right. you know, intensive right. psychotherapy. Yeah, that's not real. Yeah. Yeah. Jay, yeah, I think an achromatic that. x-ray lens could fix it, yeah. but it's in the future. <laughs> so, right, but, nice try, Bob. But, Go ahead, Jay. <laughs> it's, it's very, very likely that conspiracy theorists have a, fil- you know, a lack of filtering of apophenia because, you know, if you ever read things that cons- conspiracy theorists say, it's like massive weird connections on everything, especially like with numbers and all that yeah, stuff. Oh, so yeah. it's all, it's like this is all in play here. Yeah. But pareidolia is specifically for human faces, right? right? Well, yeah. it's for visual. Visual. The, the most common one is of human face. Well, but yeah, because it our brain have is to so hardwired. Human face. Yeah, so yeah. we see human faces a lot because we are epically hardwired to recognize that pattern. And that's why when, um, you know, you see two dots and a line, we interpret that as a human face, right, which I, which I think is really cool. I mean, you need basically three, three marks on a piece of paper, and we're, we're yeah. interpreting faces Even right babies, away. They, they've done tests on babies, and if you put, a, you know, objects that kind of make a face, the baby's eyes will linger on that mm-hmm. longer than those same pieces, but not in the arrangement of a face. So it's, and it's, chimpanzees, it's and, yeah, yeah it's, it's, yeah. A new study on pareidolia appeared appearing in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which was led by Susan Wardle. He didn't say penis. 
You have to say penis. That's your. Bit. That's your. That's your. He didn't to look to me. I looked at you. You did. I know. <laughs> You're like Jake. Come on. I'll, I'll say it again, then you can Thank yell you. out penis. So here we go. Mind. Here we go. Say it again. <laughs> A new study on pareidolia appearing in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. <laughs> Penis. <laughs> led, led by oh, Susan Wardle, so... not to be confused with Susan Wordle. Oh, I didn't play Wordle today. I That's haven't right. yet either. Oh, no, 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 no spoilers. No, no, no. Keep away. Go ahead. Uh, this new study suggests that not only do we see faces, but those faces have a gender. This is so cool, right? So they, their study showed that most people perceive a gender here. Now, stop. I I'm going to ask the audience because cool, I'm, I'm dying yeah. to ask you guys. So do the clap thing, George. Clap if when you see pareidolia. If you, can, if you can answer this, do you typically see a male face? All together. Now do it for female. Yeah. Okay. Mm, you, guys, you, guys are, you guys are trending with the study. The new research shows that most people are, are seeing a male face. When you see a face on a potato chip, it's, a, it's using the same regions of the brain that perceive human faces, which is really cool. It's not like a different part. Like that same mechanism in your brain, you see a oh, yeah. face on a potato chip, it's the same human face software that's going on. What if on it's a right Pringles? There. That gets a little iffy. There's, you know, they're not sure face. yet. Still the fusiform sure face chips, right? Yeah. So the yeah. researchers <laughs> wanted to know, these are the questions that they asked. They wanted to know if faces appear to be a certain age, do they have a particular emotion or gender? And the research team collected a huge array of images on their own that have like face pareidolia. They had 3,800 test subjects, which is a really nice number, and they, they, they acquired 250 photos. And the researchers found that it was four times more likely that people see the illusory faces of males. So 80-20. Age 20. So this was uh, done in the U.S.? Did not not they that did it matters, say. but... This tracked the same for male and female test subjects. And the researchers said that there's no reason for us to perceive faces as one gender or another. There's no, like, hard wiring. That, oh, there's that no biological can, reason. They don't there's think so, massive yeah. social reason. It's a, so, it's a social, social yeah. perception. And yeah. another reason is that female, fa- female faces need more information. No, socially. We are, they we have are, more information. We, we are primed to think female faces need more information. When you look at a cartoon, yeah. a man cartoon face has eyes and a nose and a mouth. A, a woman cartoon face has eyelashes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we could have just as easily formatted our society where a neutral eyes, nose, mouth is a woman and the man has a mustache. We didn't do that because our society has the default gender as male yeah, yeah. and female as the other. How would, how would kids do in this survey? That's what I wonder. I like would how would know like that. four-year-olds? It, you know, four, even a four-year-old is deeply, deeply really? socialized. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think by, by the time they're four, they Would it be 80, 20, though? Old. Would it be that? Would it be that? I, I, highly I likely. Yeah. Highly yeah. likely. Isn't it my, like, I, I was thinking about this, like, because mm-hmm. when I read the, that it, it's like a social thing, I'm, st- I'm turning the wheels in my head. Like, okay. How the hell did that get into oh. our heads? Look at the signs for a bathroom. The male sign for a bathroom is a human body that could be easily male or female. What is the female sign for a bathroom? Is it a skirt? She's in a skirt. Yeah. There's nothing intrinsically female about wearing a skirt. You know could what be I mean? A kilt. It could be. Well, yeah. <laughs> but I'm saying like we have two legs, two arms, and a head. Yeah. Like there's nothing about that, but that right. has been our social convention for all of human history. Right. So it's, is it, that it's a ma- thousand examples of that that gets over into and our over. Eye. And yeah. like I think I've given this example before. I remember going to the gym once, and there was the skeleton or the musculoskeletal system. System, and it was like a, you know, like the posters you see, like the anatomical posters. And it said the musculoskeletal system, and it was a man's body. And next to it, it said the female musculoskeletal system, and as a woman's body. The default was man. It didn't say the male musculoskeletal system. And something as simple as that, I know it sounds so small, yeah, exactly. so fundamental. And when you're saying it's equal in men and women, I am not surprised yeah. because we have implicit bias. Think right. of like female and male clown faces, you know, not to freak anybody out if you don't enjoy clowns. <laughs> but, yeah, it's like to, to, for, a, for a female clown to, to identify visually as a female clown, she has to put some kind of extra female things to it, even though it's all a facade anyway. It's such a weird thing to think about, like a, a defaulting emojis to male. But we default everything to male. Right. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. Male is normative in our culture, and female is other. And we have to change that. 50,000 years of societal living, right? I mean, 50,000 years of male dominance. Yeah. 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 There's no question. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's what's well, going look, on. we yeah. are seeing legitimate signs that things are starting to at least begin to... Listen, things are better than they've ever been yeah. before. They're just nowhere near good enough. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It can't stop. I mean... But yeah, it's definitely social. There's no way that's biological. Well, think about, better. like, looking at emojis, like, Asian cultures smile with their eyes and their emojis, and mm-hmm. Western cultures smile with the mouth, right, and the emojis. Why is that? It's just cultural. If you yeah, grew up in that culture... 
Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and, and that translates country. to emojis. You know, it's the same thing. Yeah, you, yeah but what if, are, what if they had the, the, the strength, the, 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 I guess the testosterone, which is kind of doesn't make yeah. a lot of sense, but what if women were the powerful, that, the more that physically strong, physically, yeah. physically yeah. powerful? That is an interesting question that I think um, uh, anthropological, kind of feminist anthropologists and sociologists often grapple with. Is like, what was the thing that allowed men to take power yeah. and, and it has and to be the physical i think that's a large part of it is oh, the yeah. physical yeah, dominance so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. at least early on we were just talking last night about like how men would not be able to live as women for oh, any God. extended God. amount of time between this <laughs> this uh, fear of safety we we're talking at, uh, at dinner we last about night that study we talked about a study, study about I yeah this idea study. of like you know what what steps do men take to ensure their safety versus what steps do women take to ensure their safety men tend to like oh, i lock my door at night and then women will have 35 steps of when they're leaving the thing and keys in the hand and make sure you're not alone blah, 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 blah. and guys are clueless yeah, it blows that. their mind when yeah. we talk it reminds me of almost like i remember when the whole me too thing was happening and i had all these male friends who were like, can you believe? Can you? I can't believe. And I'm like, you know, it's been happening this whole time. You're only just now finding out about it. Like, that's People, the difference. Guys in power were abusing them? <laughs> it's their sexual uh, impropriety? Can you believe? Well, yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Jay. So we're going to go on with science or fiction. <laughs> it's time for science or fiction. We have a theme this week. It's the theme. Science or fiction. Oh, is that, uh, is that our new theme song? That's, That's a theme yeah, song. I was working on that all afternoon. <laughs> it's not Boston. No, what? It's Cambridge. The, Boston. But the theme the is New England geology. Uh, New England ooh. geology. I thought the theme was not Boston. It is and Boston. I was like, no, no, I know. But I thought that was technically not Boston. It's still Boston. <laughs> New England geology. New England geology. I'm going to not do well it's in It's Boston this. adjacent, but it's not Boston. Mm. Okay. All right. But you guys live in New England. Yeah, that's true. Yes, Damn that's where you're going first, Karen. <laughs> All right, here we go. It's not going to help them. Just relax. <laughs> <laughs> Item number one. Yeah, Item number one. New England is primarily composed of volcanic island arcs. Item number two, Plymouth Rock geologically originated in northern Canada and was deposited in the current location by the Laurentide Glacier 20,000 years ago. And item number three, New England was adjacent to modern-day Morocco in Africa when part of Pangaea, evidenced by their identical lithographic sequences. Wow. All right, so number one, New England's made of volcanic islands. Number two, Plymouth Rock was moved down by, from Canada by the, uh, a glacier. And three, uh, when, when part of, New, of, of Pangaea, New England was next to Morocco. Mm-hmm. Okay? And George goes first. Well, I don't want, George doesn't have to always go first. I think <laughs> yeah. we're going to start at, uh, at Bob. Jay. At Jay. <laughs> oh, oh, nice. oh. <laughs> Nicely done. All right, so a volcanic arc. You know, an I'll give this to you. So... Um, you know Hawaiian Islands, yeah. where you have like like an archipelago, but of volcanoes. Wow. There's a stationary it, well, there's, hot source. Yes. And it, it, yeah. And yeah, you the have crust moves the over crust it. moving over a hot source, so you get plumes. Fascinating. You get a uh, chain cool. of volcanic islands. So basically, New England was composed of these volcanic islands, basically clumped okay. together. And that's what made this. All right, so I'm going to apologize right out of the gate to any geologist listening to this podcast. <laughs> Please don't judge me on how horribly I'm going to... So I would argue that everything comes from volcanic activity, right? At some point, right? I, would, I don't know. So everything is coming from a volcanic arc, so that's science. Um, <laughs> Plymouth Rock is geologically or originated in northern Canada and was deposited... All right, so a glacier pushed down this giant... You know, landmass, right? It's not, it's not an actual rock you're talking about, right? You're talking no, about a landmass. I'm talking rock about rock. Plymouth Rock. The rock. It's a rock. Okay, and it's huge. It's a boulder. It's, yeah, it's a boulder. Well, you know, and that's, and that's where they it's landed the boats. Than and they were like, and they it well, Plymouth that's rock. the myth. Yeah. yeah. All right, Mythology so this gigantic, oh, a gigantic boulder. Mm-hmm. Now, this is no, uh, no stretch of the imagination. Uh, like, tons of rocks got pushed by glaciers. This one has to be science. It makes perfect sense how that rock got there. And you know how you can tell? <laughs> Has if, to be, if a, Jay, if has a to rock be. is a glacier Have rock, you nothing? do you guys how? know how you can tell? Because it's round? No, oh. it, because there are lines on it that show how, that it was yeah. pushed. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, Anybody so, seen Plymouth Rock up close? Think, yeah. no. So no. by <laughs> by default, I'm going to say that the third one is fiction because I have absolutely no idea where Morocco the, is. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Africa. No, but you're saying like Northern Africa. You know. Yeah. You know, t- 10 billion freaking years ago, this landmass was touching one. this, couple whatever, you know, couple hundred million. million, whatever, same thing. The, uh, they were touching each other and, you know, Pangea yeah, and the whole thing. Who the hell knows? I have no idea. It's, Lots it's of fiction. people know, I think. Go, Evan. Go Evan. <laughs> All right, Evan. To me. Why are you giving it to me? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, I'll start with number two, actually. The, um, yes, originated in northern Canada, was deposited in its current location by the glacier 20,000 years ago. I believe that is right. Um, I think that's true of not only Plymouth Rock, but a lot of other features of, you know, New England and the area. I believe the island of Long Island is, in fact, a series of those kinds of rocks that were all pushed down oh, cool. uh, by, by the glaciers, my understanding. So I have no problem with Plymouth Rock being one of those. I'll jump to the first one for no reason. I'm jumping around. Primarily composed of volcanic island arcs. Um, it's probably the one I don't have the greatest sense for. I would not heard that before, but I wouldn't be surprised. Not too distant from kind of what Jay was saying. A lot of things at some point may have had some sort of volcanic attachment to them. The third one is the one I think also is the fiction, New England adjacent to modern-day Morocco. I don't think that's right. I, I When we took – am I allowed to say this? Am I giving away too much if I state something what, do you that, know the absolute we thing is truth? Or well, no, I don't know the absolute thing it. is true. But what I do you know can, is true. Yeah, yeah. When we took Defend our yourself. trip to England in 2018 and we went to the Scottish Highlands, mm-hmm. remember what we talked about there? Mm-hmm. I and mean, Why a lot of the features and things are similar to what we kind of see in, in, New in the New England area is because they were at one point connected. So yeah. I don't think it was Morocco. I think it was more of a northern connection. You think connection. it was only connected to one Well, no, I mean, mass. but yeah. no, it could, have, it could have been multiple. It could have all joined at one point. I mean, Pangea like, was the one Appalachian Trail, those ma- right. that mountain line, it continues in Scotland. So that's why that's why I'm thinking uh, the Morocco oh, one. Sorry about that. Is uh, is fiction? So I'm, I agree with Jay. Okay, Bob. I've seen the image before of Pangaea and where all the modern continents and countries are all smooshed smush together. I have no memory of, of you know any of those details. So that's possible. Plymouth Rock, for sure. I mean, if you see an isolated gargantuan boulder somewhere, just like kind of by itself, the glacier deposited it. So that, that makes perfect sense as well. I mean, I have a, a knee-jerk um, problem with this volcanic island arc. Um, I've seen images and, and, and read a lot about Hawaii and how, how the, the crust moves over the stationary hotspot and an island forms. And then as it moves off, then the volcano dies. And then the actual island, it gets weathered away to below sea level. And it's, it's really fascinating. And if you see images of the, of the seafloor, you could see all these bumps that are going up and, you know, up and north. But I don't see any compression of anything. I'm not, so that's, and I'm sure there could be a geological way that they could compress. But in the images that I've seen of Hawaii, of other volcanic arcs, I don't see that. So I'm just going to say, because that's all the information I have, that that's fiction. Okay, Kara? Yeah, I mean, I, so I visited Morocco. So you said modern-day Morocco in Africa. So part of Morocco is the Sahara Desert. So geologically, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think a lot of people maybe don't realize that part of Morocco is also like these massive Atlas Mountains. And I could see some similarities, but also it doesn't look that dissimilar to the Scottish Highlands. There's definitely something going on there. But when I, it's true, I'm trying to think of like, South America and Africa, and I thought maybe Morocco was down here, like closer to like halfway through South America. But then I'm like, maybe it was this way and not this way. So that one's kind of, uh, it's interesting. Um, Good thought. Plymouth Rock, I like. With that, that one is, seems cromulent, which means it's probably the freaking fiction because he just made it up because, of course, that's what he does. Um, the volcanic island arcs is probably science because it's like, whoa, no way. Everybody's going to think that's the fiction. I guess when I think of, of historical <laughs> volcanic things, there's usually some sort of dormant or act like dormant volcano there or like a crater situation. And I don't, I don't know enough about New, New England to know if there's a famous crater or if there's anything like that. But I don't, I don't associate volcanism at all with New England. Right, right. I associate it with like the West Coast and nor, you know, the Pacific yeah. Northwest. And, and so I don't know. It's uh, that one. But that's it's probably why it's the freaking science and not the fiction. But I think, I think I have to go with my gut and say that, yeah, the, it's it's not composed of volcanic island arcs. All right, even split, George. Break the tie. Oh, is it really even? What did you guys me go? And you. With? Me and you. Oh, Jay and okay. I are Morocco. Oh, you guys are Morocco. Gotcha. 
You know, as the host of the Geologic Podcast. <laughs> oh, that's right. Damn. You would think I would want to answer this question. And I, I, to me, it feels like all three are fiction. And it's really confusing me. And the thing that, the one that feels the least fiction-y to me is the, is the Plymouth Rock one. Because it seems so obvious. So ooh, I know. It makes me feel George, like this is a big, big scam here. Yes. That Plymouth Rock is like not – Plymouth Rock isn't that big. It's like in, in, historically when you, hear, when you hear about it as a kid, you think like, oh, they landed at Plymouth Rock. And then you finally make that trip and you go and you see it. Oh, it's you've like, seen it? Yeah. Uh, you're like, I've never seen oh. It. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Looks it looks like right? the Prudential logo. It? Right? It's not big. Yeah. It's, not, it's like not even a. It's not even a VW. It's not even right. It's like yeah. Like it's not rock. that big. So I think it's what? not. It might not be big enough to be the, one of those glacial things. So I'm going to go with that. No sweet. Yes, no George. sweet. Just, no sweet. I love don't, George. I don't move that. forward. Don't move forward. Now, George, isn't it correct that you've gotten every science or fiction wrong? No, he's got. He no, got, he's got uh, almost every. <laughs> almost. No, he broke the history. Point oh oh two percent. Let me talk to George a little bit more. Settle down. He's locked in. I put it to you, George. Yes. Costanza, your decision, and just change it. No. Lock in, lock in. Statistically, I think gut. I'm correct. George. Let's go with your gut. George, this will be I'm an, wrong. If I'm you're right, a, so, okay. it's an epic victory. I'm that asshole right. at the poker table. Right. It's like, <laughs> all in, all, all in. in. <laughs> all right. And let's again, see. That's my, that's my rationale. I, let's I know it's see wrong, what the locals think. <laughs> all right? Uh, yes. So if you think that the volcanic island arcs making New England is the fiction, clap. A lot of people. Right. If you That's think right. that Plymouth Rock is the fiction, clap. Ooh. And if you think that the New England being next to Morocco is the fiction, clap. Even split. No, well, one in three. One in three. three. Even. Volcanic, yeah, the least, the least the was for George. There were fewer people, but they were more were emphatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Very confident clap. Enthusiasm <laughs> doesn't I'm, count. I'm going with a very confident clap. It's a numbers game. Saying. Enthusiasm does not count. All right, so we're all spread out. So we'll take them in order. order. <laughs> Here we New go. England is primarily composed of volcanic island arcs. Bob and Kara, you think that's the fiction. A few people in the audience think that one is the fiction. And that one is Say it. science. Oh. Because you, you don't think of it. New England being a volcanic no, part of, of the world. Don't. But it is. Wow. And there's, there is an Atlantic hotspot, just like there's a Hawaiian hotspot mm. in the Pacific. It's dormant now. Yeah. But in ages past, it created these island, volcanic island arcs which then got smashed into the core of the North American continent, building it out from the sides. And New England is all of these volcanic island arcs. Now, Wouldn't that then, by definition, make the last one fiction? <laughs> Why? Well, I'm trying to think geologically, if it's volcanic no, it island arcs. It's independent of where they ended up when they were in Well, Pangea, if it's in the right? middle of Pangaea. They, okay, okay, we'll see. We'll so see. Steve, we'll see. I don't understand what you're saying. I don't understand. You're I'm just trying to, to, I don't know the timeline. Yeah, that's <laughs> The so timeline would be important. Yeah, when there was an Atlantic Ocean. Remember, the continents come and go together and apart multiple times. We're talking about four billion years. Yeah, there have yeah. been yeah. several yeah. Yeah. So didn't all landmass come from volcanic So, activity? yes and no. Um, the, you know, continental shelves basically are on top of the... Uh, oceanic shelves. Magma. Yeah, and so, so in fact, one of the things, <laughs> what, what happens? <laughs> what happened here, in fact, was that when you had an oceanic subducting crust d- diving, be- subducting beneath a, a, a continental one, that drags down water, which gets progressively squeezed out of the rock. That water rises up causes the magma to then come up, the heat to rise, forming the hot spot, which gives you the island yeah. chain. Really? Yeah, so that's what's happening. That's what, that's what happened in the Atlantic Ocean. And what Ocean. I'm saying is, if there was an Atlantic Ocean, this was geologically likely newer Pangaea had already spread. Or it could have been before. It could well, I would been, like to but, know. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it was before. If we go back okay. far okay. enough, okay. Was, was the Earth ever just a... A water planet. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And it's still, we still don't know how the first continents formed, okay. like why there are continents. But these, there, are, there are theories about the different things that happened. But basically, the ones that are stable now, they're the ones that are floating on top. Then there is the core of the continents where the rocks got compressed over and over and over again, so they're so rock solid. Yeah. You know, they don't go anywhere. New England's not that. New England is more the more recent volcanic islands getting compressed onto the core of the North, North American continent. But still not so recent that it's... Yeah. Still pre-pandemic. All right, so let's go to number two. I'm so anxious. 
I think you got this. I'm George. so anxious. Plymouth Rock geologically originated in northern Canada and was deposited in its current location by the Laurentide Glacier. That's the most recent one, 20,000 years ago. George, you think this one is the fiction. The rest of the rogues think this one is science. Most of the audience thinks this one is science. And this one is the fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, George. Good George. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> I was just trying to help. You were trying to help. I was, I was just trying to help sabotage you. <laughs> I would have had to reconsider our relationship. Yeah. <laughs> are we still on for tonight? We are so on. <laughs> it's going to be better than ever this evening. <laughs> it's going to have a great They're talking about the extravaganza, I hope. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so this was, like the, it was yeah. an obvious one to make a fiction. Now, the, so awesome. the Plymouth Rock is made of local rock, right? It's, it originated, okay. you know, it, it was moved by the, the glacier, but a ah, little bit. Ah, whoa, whoa. Not, came, from northern, oh. not from northern Not from Canada. northern Canada. It was moved But how do you feet. know? How do you really know? Because we know that. Because <laughs> okay. we can tell where the rock came from. Oh, okay. It came from... <laughs> it came it's from... It's Plymouth on it. That's where it is. <laughs> it was like... PS sticker on it. Literally, like, it was literally like maybe 100 miles north of Massachusetts. Okay. Like, it okay. was moved a little bit, but it was not... It didn't come from Canada. Because they could tell what the source of the, the, yeah. the rock is. Why don't they call it Massachusetts rock, then? Well, what, to your, what you were saying, James, going to Jay, what you were saying, George, <laughs> it's smaller than you think. Yeah. That's because it's a lot smaller than it used to be. Uh, um, yeah, so, you know, the, early on, the story came, again, whether it's literally true or whatever, that, that that's the rock they stepped on, you know, when they landed. Um, but uh, so since then... People have been chipping away at it for souvenirs. <gasps> and, and I mean, massively decreasing its size. Then at one point, it split in two. And they took half of it away and put it in a museum. And then I think they brought it back and they kind of repaired it. And now it's covered so you can't touch it. But, yeah, I mean, it's a lot smaller remnant from what it was okay, originally. Okay. So that's part of why it's unimpressive. Oh, Plymouth it's Chip now. Plymouth <laughs> Chip. Do you also, even if it was much bigger, do you think yeah. there's a thing about, like, back then just things weren't as big? No. Like, how big were there, was their boat? No. Well, oh. Why does that have anything to do with the rock? I don't the know. Old, the old... I just, no, I think there's a perspective thing here. And maybe I'm just working with this in my mind. But, like, I think things are really big now, like, engin- from an engineering perspective. Like, yeah. we're used to seeing really largely engineered oh, things. Oh, I see what you're saying. And so great things It was more impressive nature, to them than it would be to us. That's what right. I'm that's wondering. What Did saying. they see it and go, what a big rock? And we're like, what a, it's a rock, you yeah, know? Yeah. Because we've seen everything. I and mean, we have Karen, these massive the farther back you go, the smaller true. people get. What? I mean, the farther back you go, people were smaller. That, that is true. That's you know, not really true. But not that far back. <laughs> well, it's kind of true. Yeah, but, well, kind poor of nutrition. And, yeah. Yeah. Medieval people were, had the same average height as people that around 2000. It's very recent that the average mm. European height has exceeded But that. we're not talking about that long but ago anyway. either. Anyway. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> We're only talking about a few hundred years. But I digest. All this means <laughs> New England was adjacent to modern-day Morocco and Africa when part, of, when part of Pangaea, evidenced by their identical lithographic sequences, is science. Okay. So, yeah, so let's imagine Pangaea. So, again, but there was Gondwana land. There's, like, all different, you know, co- but those after times Pangea. when, yeah. when the, the different continents smashed together partly, totally, and then came apart again. Pangaea is the most recent one. So if you, if you look at the, the way it was, so yeah, so Africa was next to South America, and then North America was on top of Northern Africa, right? So that's where North America, and then and, uh, like England and Scotland and Europe kind of squeezed right in there. So we, we are close to Scotland, but, it, but New England was adjacent to Northern Africa, adjacent to Morocco. And we know that based upon, we say, lithographic sequences, like if you look yeah. at the layers of rocks, they exactly match. Yeah, and, there's a, and there are the same types of rocks. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it, it seems a little counterintuitive because it's so far south. And, and, and then it was, Evan, was, I was hoping you guys would go, no, wasn't it supposed to be next to Scotland? Because that kind of makes sense. But no, it's Morocco. <laughs> well done, Steve. All right, George, well done. Oh. Yeah, George. Finally. George. I tell you, George, it's having confidence and sticking with your guns often pays off on science or fiction. When you go with the crowd, sometimes you get burnt. So right, thank you for, Jay. for resisting Jay. Costanza. The majority of this audience I, I, learned something. That's today. true. I really thought I was At least one. Jay. <laughs> All right, Evan, give us a quote. All right, let's bring it back to Boston, shall we? Let us tenderly and kindly cherish, therefore, the means of knowledge. Let us dare to read, think, speak, and write. John Adams. And if I have to tell you who John Adams is, you're in the wrong time. Okay? You're in the wrong time. So we need more public media. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
All right, thank you. And x-ray lenses. <laughs> thank you all for joining me this week. Thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you, Boston. Thank, Boston. Thank, yeah. thank you, Boston, for hosting us. And until next week, this is your Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. <laughs> Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is produced by SGU Productions, dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible.